You have reached the Geek Elite. Good luck. Man, that movie was excellent. It really was. Totally blew my expectations away. I know, right? Now I really want to tell everyone about it. But I'm not sure how. Yeah. If only there was a podcast dedicated to reviewing films and discussing the latest news and trailers on upcoming films. That would be nice. Yes, for sure. And we can call it The Senegai Show. (laughs) What? No. It will be called Real Movie Critic Unleashed. Uh, No. How about Senegai featuring Real Movie Critic? Uh, how about the Real Movie Critic and his sidekick? The Senegai. CG and RMC. RMC and CG. The real movie critic versus the Senegai. Only at CertainPOV.com or wherever you get your podcasts. You're going down, critic. Bring it on, guy. Welcome everybody to We Have Issues, Geek Elite Media Show that's about everything literary. Books, comic books, web comics, manga, and everything else you might be reading. We're here to talk about them. As always, I am your host, Keith, and I'm joined by my Star Wars sidekick, who is always at my side, Josue. Hey, and I'm always happy to be here. Love talking yes. comics. Yeah, it was a really good week of comics in that there were some real standout books. Yeah. And I cannot wait to talk about them with you. But as always, we do dip into the news real quick. Um, so a couple things interesting here. Um, first of all, the estate of Steve Ditko has attempted to regain copyright for both Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. Oof. That's huge. It is huge. And again, we were talking about before we started recording that this isn't the first time they attempted this. And back in the day, they kind of went they went after more characters as well. Mm-hmm. So this will be interesting. Like, again, like they're not going to let go of Spider-Man or even now Doctor Strange. I can see them letting go of Doctor Strange like before the before the MCU. But yeah, not, not anymore. It's like, but do they have a strong case? Not really. So the problem is, is he created the characters as a work for hire. Oh. Um, so he was hired by the company to create for them. Therefore, it's their property. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how it works. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, yeah. Um, apparently, um, his family is going to make the argument that the creations were made by him prior to the those books being issued, and then he just used them in Marvel, so he essentially sold them. Right. But that they basically he got a bad deal. He got cheated is what their argument's going to be. Mm-hmm. So that should be interesting to keep an eye on. I do not anticipate him really getting much. Oh, his family getting much from it, so. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, next thing I want to talk about is a thing that I think you're going to be excited about. Um, there is a um, new comic coming to Kickstarter, and it's written by Tony Fleeks. Ooh, okay. From Stray Dogs. Yeah. With artist Christian Meezy, and it's, uh, it's called um, Time Shopper. It's going to be released in a European album-sized hardcover comic. Okay. This has been this was originally set for release back in 2019. Huh. Yeah, but it's finally set for release, and um, yeah, it looks really cool. It's it's got some time travel stuff in it. Like, um, he basically he compared it to Rick and Morty or Bill and Ted, basically. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so it'll be fun, but also have some like time travel like stuff in it. So that I'm kind of excited to about that. Yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, we love Tony because of, you know, Stray Dogs, so. Oof, yeah, it fucking kills me with that one. Yeah. <laughs> the next thing I wanted to talk about is something very close to my heart. Um, Sandman Act 2 is out. It's out. On Audible. <laughs> I, I was really, really trying to get it, and I 
I looked and when I got my next Audible credit, and it was two days after it came out, and I just sat here and waited. <laughs> and I finally have it. I actually ended up listening to um, an audiobook for uh, the rest of the Hornswoggle. Okay. Uh, the little little dude. He um, he put out his book, and uh, he did the audiobook for it. And so I've been listening to that, which is really good, by the way. Um, he's a super nerd, too, so... Um, but yeah, and then now I have that and I'm like, oh, I want to finish his book, but I also do not want to wait on Sandman any longer. <laughs> so we'll see. But yeah, I, it's already getting crazy good reviews. Everybody pick it up. The, remember, the first volume is free on Audible. Nice. So you can listen to it for free. You don't have to buy it. I already bought it. So, <laughs> yeah. Last thing I saw was, as we've been seeing, like, you know, DC and Marvel, they tend to do like theme covers sometimes where like we'll talk about a little later. There's some Miles Morales covers going around because of his yeah. 10th anniversary. Well, one of the next sets they're going to do is comic books greatest couples. Oh, I I just started seeing something like that. I saw uh, Cyclops and Gene one, and then those words were kind of put together. I was like, oh, that's cool. Then yeah, there's a there's a Peter and MJ one. It's mm-hmm. going to be done by RB Silva. Ooh, okay, wow. Um, let me see here. I'll just pull them. So there's that I guess one. I guess give him a break from the mutants. There's Daredevil and Elektra. Oh, damn. Juan, Juan Cabal. This one. I, nice. I can't zoom in. I hope you can see it. Elektra's upside down. Like. Oh, dope. Oh, nice. It's so pretty. Yeah, I want that so bad. Um, and then there's... Of course, my phone freaks out while I'm pulling it up. Um, there are three others. Let me just refresh. Uh, but yeah, no, I really want the Daredevil one. And then, yeah, the, the Spidey MJ one by RB Silva looks pretty cool. And um, Fantastic Four is, of course, Reed and Sue, but it's done by Natasha Bustos, which is cool. Okay. Um, then for Inferno number three, Ooh. Ev- everything I'm about to say, you're going to love, okay? All okay. Of these words. For Inferno number three, we get a Peach Momoko cover. <laughs> Featuring Mystique and Destiny. Oh, I have seen that one. Oh, yeah. fuck. So that's cool that they're lining, they're lining it up for, for this theme. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. Because that, that is a great cover. Yeah. And then Iban Coelho is going to do uh, the uh, X-Men 5 Gene and Scott one. This should be um, a Gene and Scott and a Gene and, and, a, Gene and, Emma, and a Scott and Emma. <laughs> yeah. Now, those are the ones that have been revealed. There has been teases of other couples, including Storm and Black Panther. Nice. Vision and Scarlet Witch Mm -hmm. and Captain America and Sharon Carter. Okay. Yeah. So I'm curious that that's fun. I love a good theme cover. You know me like those fucking hellfire gala. That nearly broke me, man. I spent so much (laughs) money on covers. So yeah. Uh, But that's the news I got. Anything from you? Um, No, I'm just thinking since what we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about a little bit later, but uh, Dr. Strange and, uh, like like the woman on the picture, I'm drawing, drawing blank on her name. That'd be a cool one, a good retro one for the, oh, the couples. Clea? Yeah, yeah, I love Clea. She's great. That'd be a cool one for the covers. I'm fully expecting her to show up in Doctor Strange too at some point. Oh, I know. There has to be just a little bit more on like his side of his uh, allies. Yeah. I want him. I want him to have actually two love interests and be torn between them because mm. Christine is perfect. So yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no reason for him not to pick her. But, yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, that's everything I got for news. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to throw out there is we are recording currently on Thursday. Uh, so again, peek behind the curtain. Uh, Saturday is usually the day this goes out. Uh, but I want to give a quick uh, shout out. Today is by visibility day. Yay. And uh, it's a big day. Uh, I, I love seeing so many testimonials online. Uh, from creators I love and not just like artists and writers of comics, but people who probably don't realize the impact they have, uh, you know, by being honest with themselves and telling everybody and how that gives other people courage to, you know, speak their truth. Yeah. I think um, like, like, like my, my favorite one side of like the outside, like super clicky circle, I mean, like, like mainstream people. It was like e- Ewan from yeah. what culture that we love and uh, Achilles. I, I, lo- I love his post too. Yeah. And then uh, also, Shout out to uh, Matthew from Botchamania, who's also with Cultaholic. Uh, he He's very chill about it. It's very funny. Um, if you ever listen to the Cultaholic podcast, he talks about, like, I think he intentionally kind of, like, 
talks about hot dudes sometimes just to make the others kind of like fluster. Like they don't know what to say. Not that they're weirded out by it, but they're kind of like, yeah, like, should I agree? I don't know. <laughs> like, they can't follow it up. They don't know how to follow it up. <laughs> yeah. It's just funny. So, but no, I didn't just everybody out there. I mean, happy by visibility day. Yes. And, uh, yeah, you, uh, this show will always be a quote safe space. I know everybody Absolutely. hates that term <laughs> for anyone. So, with that being said, let's dive into some comics. And boy, howdy. Are we going to start with some really, really good books? Uh, we, of course, are always going to start with the biggest of booms. Boom Studios. Yes. Uh, so we have four books. Uh, well, let's say it's three. I have four. I'm going to start with the book I have on my own, which is Dark Blood. Uh, so this was the variant cover. They didn't do another one of the uh, oh, okay. like weird domestic ones. Mm-hmm. But this is like an old school horror comic, so I dug that. Yeah. Um, so uh, written by Latoya Morgan, illustrated by Moises Hidalgo, colored by AHG, and lettered by Ann World. So for those who don't remember, this is about the um, the young black soldier who it's back in the 50s. He developed powers um, yeah. after serving in World War II. Basically what happened in the first two issues... Um, a white guy was confronting him in an alleyway. His powers came out. The white guy ran away, ran out, got hit by a car. Now everybody's blaming him for killing the white guy, saying he threatened him or something like that. And he's currently being hunted down. Um, every issue of this book has a really poignant scene where it's so, like, it's so direct about racial prejudice of the time. Hmm. And this one's no exception. The sheriff comes to talk to his wife. And is basically like, here, we're looking for him. And he's like, why are you nervous? He's like, he's like trying to get her to slip up, basically. Right. And he's saying stuff like, you know, like, um, mighty big fella, you know, is like, and it, she, he's like, shoot, he was a soldier. She's like, pilot. He's like, didn't know your kind could fly and just stuff uh. like that. Like, it was just like, it's really uncomfortable and awful, but obviously something that actually happens, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And just, it, it's really good though. I'm really enjoying it. And uh, it's doing a really good job of bouncing back and forth between the fifties and the forties and the war. And there's this really great scene where they're being hunted by Nazis in the flashback. And it's just really cool. Like okay. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for anyone reading cause it's so good, but I loved it. Uh, so I'm really enjoying this book. This is really good. It is three of six. I have that confirmed. Mm-hmm. So it is many. Uh, so it's not too much of an investment to pick up if you guys are interested. And that takes us to our shared books. No sway. We're going to yes. start with Eat the Rich number two. Okay. Written by Sarah Gailey, illustrated by P.S. Bach, colored by Roman Titoff, and lettered by Cardinal Ray. Uh, so I got the A cover, of course. Yeah. Because um, it was amazing. Uh, just, oh my gosh. So we got to describe, describe this cover. I normally don't. Um, so our hero's standing there, seemingly covered in blood, looking shocked. But if you look carefully... The blood is actually a hand holding a knife. Yeah, it took me a while to actually catch that. Yeah, it's so cool. Like it's just, it's just, uh, it's done in a way that you look at it, you're like, oh, she's bloody. Oh, like <laughs> it hits you. So that's really cool. So coming out of our last issue, uh, she witnessed um, basically <laughs> the a rich people. Murder. <laughs> yeah, murder the retired helper and consume him and. She's like, what the fuck? As one would. And she's just like, we need to get the fuck out of here. And she's all freaking out. She tries to talk to her, her boyfriend and he's all zonked out because he took a, uh, a pill to like help him sleep. Uh, Clonopin, I think. Yeah, it was Clonopin. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's like, no, we need to talk. And then he, he's like, uh, all groggy. So he doesn't really participate much. She does some snooping and she discovers some stuff and she runs into the nanny. Yep. Uh, who, Pedal. by the way, uh, like this is inappropriate because this book isn't really about that kind of thing, but she, she looks pretty good. <laughs> like, uh, I, 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 yeah. This panel, uh, she reminded me of Alice. She kind of looked like Alice to me in this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last yeah, two I shots. Did. Yeah. I was like, you cute, girl. <laughs> so um, basically, she finds out, yes, that's the deal. All these poor people come here and they're servants and they're they're all their medical bills are paid every any problem they have is solved and their servants but in the end when they're retired they get to eat them yeah that's the deal which is twisted and insane 
Uh, so that kind of sets up what's happening, you know, going forward. There's a few more moments near the end, of course. We get a nice uh, dramatic tease of, you know, the next confrontation she's going to have. But oh, yeah. what did you think, man? I mean, it was just, it's really cool how, like, it's not really what you're expecting her, like, oh, she's going to go, she's going to go snoop around, she's going to find something and then hold it a secret. It's like, no, like, we get answers in this one. And yeah, like we said, like, it's, it's part of the deal. But in the case where, in, in this case where you're just kind of like, well, we should just let them, right? Because it's like they were going to have a shittier life anyway. Either, either that or they would have already been dead had they not taken this job. So it's kind of like it's on them. It's everybody's choice. It's kind of like, fuck. It's just it's so twisted. Yeah. And it's it's just twisted's a good word. And what I feel bad for her is that she. Um, how do I put it up? Uh, OK, she. She's doing this horror movie thing that I that I love. It's one of the few tropes in horror I absolutely love. Mm-hmm. Where her whole thing is, I just need to talk to my boyfriend. We need to talk about it. You know, yeah. I can explain it and we'll run. And I'm like, what are the chances that he isn't in on this? That he's you know not. I mean? oh, yeah, like he has to know what's going on. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I'm kind of like, oof. Like that's gonna be a bad disappointment for her. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, pretty good. Really enjoyed yeah, so far, it. So. so far, it's good. Yeah. All right, let's talk about good luck number four. Yes. All right, so good luck number four. I got the A cover. Written by Matthew Ehrman, illustrated by Stefano Simeone, letter by Mike Fiorentino. God, this book is getting trippier and trippier. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so good, and... It's so tragic. It's such a tragic book, and you wouldn't think it looking at the visuals, mm-hmm. but it's an incredibly tragic book in a lot of ways. Yeah, once you get the context, once you start reading, you're like, oh, no. And it's, it's called good luck, so you're going in like kind of with a chipper attitude, and it's like, mm-mm, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. It's really, really good. I'm really enjoying it, but it's just like, it's of course, we're talking about the book about the gods of luck coming to earth. Mm-hmm. Um, these luckless children being sent to them. And we find out that the luckless children are basically just a distraction. You know, they're just literally sent yeah. in there to like, to absorb all the traps, basically <laughs> like yeah. to use a D and D, you know, thing, you know, you, you, you throw something down the, the, <laughs> the hall. So all the traps will go off and then you can go in, you know, like it's really sad. Like uh, it is. I mean, like honestly with like the first issue being kind of dense, and at this point, it was kind of like, I've loved every issue since then, just because, like, we actually get some information. But at the same time, like, you just hit with, like, all these feels. Like, honestly, okay, in this issue, I fucking love that the that, that chairman guy fucking died. Like, I, I did not want him, like, lingering around anymore. And how he went was actually really cool. Because, again, like, yeah. it just, it's just, if it wasn't for the, the pages, and even then, I, there's, like, still kind of, like, I'm still trying to wrap my head around, like, what I'm trying to understand from, like, what's happening. But... Mm-hmm. Shit, like the way he goes it's just like it's almost just like it's like a little a weird blip like the, the way that shit happens around like bad luck it's just like it's so weird to kind of comprehend how this would work out except mm-hmm. for just like we just have these kids are just like these bad luck sponges yeah yeah it's it's really cool it's really twisted and it's just so visually creative like yes that's, that's the number one thing that jumps on me with this book is just it's visually chaos but in a beautiful way like yeah uh, I just love it so all right, let's take let's go over to our last boom book, um, Once in Future number twenty, mm-hmm. written by Karen Gillan, illustrated by Dan Mora, colored by Tamara Bonville, and lettered by Ed Dukeshire. This book is incredible. Okay, I'm gonna tell Sway something I don't know if he knows. Yeah, do you know Love of Pages, our sister show? That's the the book club. Yes, Stephen has talked them into to reading Once in Future for the book club. Right. Oh, thank God. Good. So they've already recorded some of it. <gasps> he nice. told me. So. Um, and I'm very excited to hear what they think. Oh, me too. I, I definitely tune in for that one. Yeah. So um, I, I had a pretty, I, I, when I was talking to him, I was like, well, let me, let me predict a few reactions. <laughs> and then he's, I was like, this, this, this. He's like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, uh, obviously this book doesn't need an introduction at this point. We all know it. Um, it was just so cool how they retook the grail castle with the bell and, and the, the meaning of it is just like, because we do follow stories, it's like, yeah, no, we're safe here because if we know the stories, Arthur never found it, so he'll have a hard time finding us. Like, that's, yes. I love it. It's brilliant. He can't find it on his own. Exactly. So, 
Lancelot gets a badass fight. <gasps> so badass. <laughs> so fucking great. Um, and we just, we get some really tender moments with Gran. She, it's the first time she's like pretty much open and honest with Duncan. Yeah. Which I thought was really interesting. The picture of her and her daughter was so sad. Mm-hmm. I was like, Jesus, dude. And just, yeah, there's so many sides to this all now. Guinevere's design. Oh my God. So dope. <laughs> like, and then, of course, that last page reveal. Just amazing. It's just so awesome. Like the way this book introduces, like, or the way this every book just... issue, there's one of those. There's a final page reveal of something, like, and it's incredible. The cliffhangers of this book are have just been incredible. Issue after issue is like, who's this guy? Oh, that's that character. What the fuck's gonna happen now? But every single time, you're like, it's literally with some of the best cliffhangers in the fucking game right now. Oh yeah, love this book so much. Yeah. The last, it's the kind the of last, cool. It's the kind of thing. If you have no idea what the cliffhanger is, yeah, you're still like that's cool. It, but right? if you know what it is, <laughs> you're like fuck yes, like <laughs> so great. The whole Lancelot bit when we come back to the battle and you just see just like the bunch of lines of him just like slicing up. Oh and yeah, he, and like the way he just lands and like all the bodies just falling. I love the panel after that. We've been seeing Merlin and this Arthur uh just being super cool being super like villainous and just like um and just like just being like their own ver- their own badass version of themselves hmm. seeing arthur this arthur flinch or just being shocked at lancelot on the other side holy fuck like now i really want to like no like jump on this side of the story and just kind of focus on this lancelot for a while yeah definitely like it's just so dope like i just love it and uh, i also just noticed that i knew he was like made out of water he had the fins i just noticed he actually has fish inside of his body yeah 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 Yeah, Yeah, such a good touch (laughs) yeah uh so that wraps it up for boom let's switch over to scout i have a special treat impossible jones number one once again this is a variant cover i got it's the one in ten i didn't know that ten right yeah, one in ten. I bought it from uh, Greg's. I had an adventure this week. Okay, so let's let's go through this. Okay, I went to Samurai. Yeah, in Mesa, uh, but I I left late, so I missed some books. So I went to Greg's and I got a couple of them, but I was still missing Moon Knight. Ooh. So I went to Samurai and Chandler. Ooh, and they didn't have Moon Knight. Damn. I said, "Can you check Samurai and Phoenix for me so I don't <laughs> drive down there?" And they said they don't have it. Fuck. And I was like, well, I need I need bags anyways, and I forgot to buy some. So I made my third comic book purchase of the day. And then I was about to drive away, and I was like, I wonder if there's another comic book store. And I found a fourth comic book store that I called, thankfully. <laughs> and I was like, hey, I just want to know if you guys have a comic that came out today. And the guy's like, oh, we have a line. Uh, you want to call back in 30 minutes? I'll check for you. And I'm like, what oh, fuck? yeah, I'll call back. And then I hung up, and never I'm never going there again. <laughs> and then the, a fifth comic book store where I called, and I asked, and the guy's like, yeah, sure. I have Moon Knight. I'm like, can you set one aside? He's like, yeah, sure, definitely. Nice. I'm like, cool. And I went by, and it's actually one of the places that are licensed to, like, grade comics. Oh, damn. And they have, like, a kind of a low low, um, low stock. They don't have a ton of books, but they basically live off the new releases every week. So. Okay. What was the name of the store? I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. They were cool, though. Really nice guys. Um, but anyways, so that was my adventure. I five comic book stores technically one i never actually went to but this one anyways possible jones uh so when i went to greg's and i picked it up and the guy's like what a great cover right And i'm like yeah while well, it's pain and he's like yeah that's the one in ten i'm like it is <laughs> he's like yeah and i'm like oh i didn't know that i'm like cool <laughs> i was like so uh script and inks by carl kessel pencils by david hahn colors by tony avina letters by comic craft so this is a classic superhero story and okay. done in a classic superhero story style. Uh-huh. But with a cool twist to it that I think you'll dig. Okay. So so the character is Impossible Jones. And you can see her here. You know. Okay. And she's like a stretchy character. And this is um, Holly, Holly Days. <laughs> I see. So it's very like Batman the Animated Series, right? And... She stops them. It's like all cartoony. Holly Days uses a menorah as a weapon. Cause oh my Days. god! Yeah, like yeah, it's it's just really cheesy and dumb. And then we get a one month earlier flashback, and we see her trapped in a room. She's like, "What the hell's going on?" And then something happens, and basically the place explodes. You find out that she was actually a thief. Oh, 
with a group of uh, other thieves and they left her behind during a heist in a factory and she was put into like this experimental chamber and that's what gave her her powers. We also meet um, some other heroes and it's just delightfully cheesy, uh-huh. like invincible, you know, <laughs> like, so like pole cat, he uses the pole. <laughs> okay. And, um, uh, Captain Lightning, who's like their su- their Superman, I guess, but he's got a ray gun. Okay. And then even Steven, who is this dude. Wow. Okay, that's kind of cool. So <laughs> even Steven's great because he's all like about the balance. And he goes, uh, he like for instance, he calls Captain Lightning, Captain Lightning. And Captain Lightning goes, it's good you're here, Steven. He goes, even Steven. <laughs> Please use my full name as I use yours. Let us deal with each other equally (laughs) oh my god (laughs) and then they have this discussion he's like wait wait why don't you just call him captain and he'll call you steve and he's like that is acceptable (laughs) like like, and just yeah there's like a lot of characters like that that are introduced and so this girl gets powers and she becomes a hero is the idea right Mm -hmm. and she's like i'm gonna be a hero and so she has her powers. she gets away from the bad guys and her quote is um uh, you can do things. You got powers like Persephone, like Captain or like goddamn Captain Lightning should have died, but didn't been given a second chance, a chance to do things differently. And I will. I've made mistakes, but that changes now. Got things to fix. Things to set right. Starting with payback on the bastards that left me to die. <laughs> so, oh, damn. So she's on like a revenge tour as a goofy superhero. As a so. hero, that's just still a, re- a revenge story. Damn. Okay. That's a good twist. Yeah, it's really cool. I really dug this book. Like, I love it. It's 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 just goofy. I love a good goofy book. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Commanders in Crisis just ended. Oh yeah, it had a bunch of goofy heroes too, so it fills a nice niche for me. So, takes us over to Oni Press. Oni is one book, and it's Jana and the Impossible Monsters number six. Um, not going to spend too much time on this one. It was more of a development issue. Written by Chris and Laura Samney. Art by Chris Samney. Uh, colors by Matt Wilson. And letters by Crank. Uh, it's just more of the same great stuff, which just includes Jonna beating up giant monsters and <laughs> nice. doing her cute little pose. Like, look at her. Aww. It's a very cute book every time we talk about it. <laughs> it's so great. Uh, I know Gail Simone loves this book, if that sells nice. it to anybody. So. Um, but basically, the older sister, she gets in trouble for, for shoplifting some food because she doesn't have any money. She's trying to save her sister. There's this whole thing going on. And yeah, basically she's trying to free her sister and she gets the key to unlock the cage. And that's where we cut. So uh, like I said, these, uh, these books don't really contain a lot of story because they're mostly, mostly very visual. So it's, um, it's, it's not like they pack as much into it as some other, you know, very story driven books, but it's yeah. fun. It's just such a great visual ride and, and it's kind of goofy and like, just, I don't know. I just really, really enjoy it. And, um, it's just cute, cute as hell. It just makes me think of shit like Hanna-Barbera and, you know, stuff like that. So it's great. She's got real bam, bam energy, I guess. Is the way it. Yeah. And she kind of looks like it. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> all right, we're moving on to another publisher. Uh, we haven't talked about them in a couple months, uh, ever since Eros and Psyche ended. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, that was it. Ablaze. He who fights with monsters, number one. So, uh, I put this on Hostway's radar. I, I send him my list, and he's like, oh, he who fights with monsters, what's that? And I'm like, well, the artist is worth a Deladera from something is killing the children. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's all we need to know, right? <laughs> like, So, <laughs> creative team. Uh, story by Francesco Artebani. Art by Werther Deladera, colors by Giovanna Nero, and letters by Troy Pateri. And this is a World War II story. Um, summer 45, is that the end of the World War II, or is that after? At the end. Uh, so yeah, we're kind of dealing with almost like, dur- like during the end of it, and a little bit post after that, because it's like almost yeah. like this, like, getting to like the split of Berlin, really. Yeah, and we just get this really interesting story Uh that it starts in 1945, which is the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's right. Then we go back. But then yeah. it flashes back three years. So it'd be mm-hmm. 42. So that's the middle of the war. That's, that's the right. part of the war. And it's in Prague. And it's about uh, a doctor who is Jewish and is trying to basically do the whole underground thing, you know, like 
trying to be a doctor, trying to help his fellow um, Jewish people, and the Nazis are hunting them and all this stuff. And it's just really cool. It develops some really fun characters right off the bat. Yeah, uh, between the doctor, the little boy, uh, the the uh, the woman is it his mother? Yeah, the little boy's mother, and then the old man. And we get this cool tease that might lead to something a little more magical. And I'm curious to see if it actually goes that direction. Yeah, yeah. Which, if you know anything about Jewish culture and the, quote, magic quote around it, you know, we're probably talking about the golems. (laughs) And I always, I was always fascinated with golems. Maybe it's the Terry Pratchett fan in me, but I think golems are amazing. And it's such a cool idea. And also, we just I just read Lady Baltimore with the golem in it. Uh, literally kind of the same situation. So. Hmm. Uh, but I really dug this. I love the... Uh, obviously, I love the art because it's where they're... Um, there's a certain atmosphere to this book. Yeah. I think it really captures the grimness of the time really well. Yeah. Um, honestly, for real. Like, he sets a, the, the danger of like when, when he's like sneaking around, being after hours after curfew, and he gets like stopped, and he has to think like, quick on his feet to be like to cop an excuse so I don't start digging into his stuff. And it's like, yeah, you sense like the danger, like the fucking dread there. It's like one slip up and it's all fucked. You're, 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 you're you disappear. Yeah, exactly. So it's good. It's really good. I'm excited to see where it goes. This was translated, I'm pretty sure. Ooh, okay. Because uh, I followed Francesco on, um, and, and he doesn't speak English as a first language, so okay. I bet it was translated. And I'm just, I'm, just, I'm so curious, like, like just like flipping through it again, like co- going back to like because you're right, I had it backwards, like the beginning and going backwards, but it's like, yeah. Now I want to know what like the, the the I'm I'm curious about the puppeteer now, the one who yeah, initi- initiates the story at the end. Yeah, yeah exactly. right. <laughs> so yeah, that's interesting. Uh, cool. So let's move on to AfterShock Comics. I got one book in Aftershock, but Josue's got one, and I'm going to let him start. Tell me about Bunny Mask 4. Yes. Bunny Mask number 4, uh, written by Paul Tobin, uh, artist and colors by Andrea Moody, and letters by Taylor Esposito. Um, of course, the sweet, bloody red inside info page, because it's a bloody book. Mm-hmm. So we left off with a bunch of like shadow wolves coming into fuck it all up like for mess it up for our main character and the sheriff that's around and bunny mash shows up to save the day and as they're fighting she's basically like she let like you think that they're with her right like they, they show up and then she's around um but she's there she's giving a little monologue and she's letting these dogs bite her and then as she's her little her little line is more mostly like talking about what is going on it's like no you're only flesh bones and dust and the, the, it literally disintegrates like the the, the sh- these like these uh, shadow dogs it's like all right meanwhile like every, like all the other two guys are getting bitten and like just like getting like ravaged like all around but she ends up saving the day in a weird fashion where <laughs> he gets like the the, the main guy uh, he gets bit on the shoulder and she comes she comes up to him and licks the wound but she has like a mm. like a giant like snaky tongue and it kind of hurts him for a second and then she kind of like initiates going a little more forward on him and it does happen. And then he comes to just by himself in the middle of the street. And then the sheriff kind of finds him and is like, all right, so what the fuck just happened? And now the, the sheriff is kind of be like, uh, to be honest, I don't know, but I keep hearing these whispers, like these, like they call it the snitch. Cause these whispers, as you're walking around, it starts pretty much like it starts like snitching the pe- the people who are walking around you it starts snitching their deepest darkest secrets and you get like these like a lot of quote bubbles where it's just like yeah a bunch of fucked up stuff that people are, have done that obviously would never tell anybody else and the sheriff is just like yo i'm fucking tired of it i'm going back to the cave like i, I want i want to figure this shit out where, where we found you the protagonist um from the first issue and he, he was kind of like eh, i don't want to but okay i kind of want to and they go they realize like all right so what the fuck is really happening here and out of nowhere, like ghouls, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll call them ghouls, not zombies. They, they kind of come back out and they're just kind of like in this weird trance where it's like, we're here to dig, shovel and pick, muscle and sweat. And they're just kind of repeating that and they're just freaking out. Like they start, start, they start blasting at them, nothing's happening. They start getting overwhelmed. B, the actual little girl B shows up in her ghoulish form and she just, she meets up with uh or she's she's like the guy and she's like i told you we were gonna die here and he's 
at that point, it's like, okay, I don't, I don't know how to fight anymore. <laughs> and that's when they really get overwhelmed. Enter Bunny Mask. Now, is this future, or not future, is this old B, as we've been suspecting that she's Bunny Mask, but what is this entity? Because as soon as Bunny Mask shows up and she sees little B, she goes, I know you. I have never been alive, but I have but I have been dead for far longer than you. And she touches little B and she disintegrates. It's kind of like, okay, yeah, like what? And then <laughs> if that didn't get weird enough, she kind of like almost like disappears in a way, or she, she puts the, the sheriff like, uh, like unconscious. And then you enter this weird, this thing, this thing, this like the cycloptic thing. Oh, fuck. I know I was not expecting this, but it was so cool. And he starts saying, he starts to start, starts telling that um, he's almost like he's still evil, but at the same time, he's the opposite of bunny mass. Like, I, he starts encouraging them because he he can also do like like these two guys aren't aren't innocent either, especially the sheriff. Um, this monster starts telling the sheriff, "It's like, yo, maybe you should arrest yourself. If not, maybe you should just like take it a step further and a step further after that for the stuff that you've done to others and the lies that you've told just to, just just for you to scrape by." And that's when our protagonist is kind of like, "Oh fuck this!" It throws a rock at him. Nothing happens <laughs> to him. <laughs> um, and then, but for some reason, like somehow, like the, through through dialogue, he does end up getting the upper hand. He like he does bash him like on the on the side of like he bashes the monster on the side of the head, and starts like not stopping relentlessly until. And then he, I guess like he does because of how he says it, and he rips out the the monster's tongue out. So that takes care of that, right? They're still in the cave, and Bunny Mask shows up again, and she tells our protagonist is like, okay, so here's a map, and he's like, oh, the map that Leo Leo Foster like not her dad all those time, all the, all those years ago, but that same guy. And she's like, yeah, his hand. Yes. But it was guided by the snitch's voice. So he didn't, he really, he, he really didn't know what we, what he was mapping out. And so she needs his help one more time. And he's just like, you know what? No, fuck this. This is all fucking crazy. I don't want to do anything to do with this. And she's just, and again, in her own sweet way, she's just like, it is good that you amuse me. It is required. But listen and hear this. You could tell the truth because he's about to tell like the world is like, this is crazy. I'm going to tell everybody about you and all this crazy stuff. And it's like, you could tell the truth about, uh, you can tell the truth of, of me a thousand times, but when you're dead and gone, I will, I will still be a secret. And she just vanishes. So hmm. they, like, as the, so they're finally going to head out. They're finally leaving the house slash cave. Um, and the sheriff is just like, so what are you going to do, dude? Are you going to call a bee up? And he's and the guy's like, uh, nope, <laughs> because she started she started blowing up his phone because like there was like no reception under the cave. So it's like now we just got hit with three bees or like the little girl bunny mask if that is her, and then B that's actually in the city and trying to hit him up. So and he's just like, yeah, I'm not gonna call her. I don't want anything to do with her. So that's where it ends up, and we'll see kind of if if he doesn't confronting her uh, in the next issue. But uh, bunny mask, it's just it's so weird. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, it seems like a trip of a book. It is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my Aftershock book is Campisi, The Dragon Incident, number two. Nice. So this is the one about the mobster versus the dragon. Love oh, yeah. Uh, written by James Patrick. Art and colors by Marco Licati. Letter by Rachel Deering. Here's the intro page. Ooh, Very good pretty. blue. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, it's basically like in the last issue, we have this like small neighborhood and like there's crime, but there's a guy that kind of keeps everything in order and make sure nobody does anything too bad. Neighborhood looks out for itself, you know, Spider-Man two kind of energy. <laughs> and, um, then, uh, a dragon shows up, just flies in. And then we find out, Oh, this is, this is our world, but with dragons. Okay. <laughs> and the dragon is like chilling in a construction site. And then it destroys a local restaurant. And you find out it's here looking for a guy. Hmm. And he gives them a name, and none of them know who this is. So Campisi is put in charge of trying to figure out who this dude is, where he is, what's going on. And um, at one point, he goes and tries to negotiate with the dragon. And it was pretty <laughs> funny. He, he brings in some Easter bread uh, that someone baked. And he, so he sets it down. He's like, Easter bread's really good. And then, like, him and the dragon have an argument, basically. And he goes to leave. And the dragon's like, leave the Easter bread. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, it's just fun. Like, I really dig this. And I love the whole, like, 
like literally like a mobster against a dragon. Like it's such a ridiculous combat. concept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just love it. And it turns out the guy they're trying to find is like the guy he can't like, he can't do anything about. He's the untouchable guy, basically okay. He's protected from all harm. So basically the dragons plan, plan on destroying the entire um, neighborhood unless they're able to resolve it. So it's really cool. I'm really digging it. I personally, my can- head cannon. I hope the dragon just becomes a part of the neighborhood and just chills with them. <laughs> that's cool. Like, like, oh yeah, that's the dragon. Like, <laughs> like so, yeah. But really fun. I'm really digging that book. So, all right, let's talk about Dark Horse. Um, we got two books. I got one solo, which is Norse Mythology Number Four. Uh, story words by Neil Gaiman. Script and layouts by P. Craig Russell. Letters by Galen Shulman. Uh, art is by Mark Buckingham of Fables Fame. Mm-hmm. Um, colors by Laverne Konzerski. Uh So this is continuing the previous story where Thor and Loki have a manservant because he wronged Thor. Um, we'll, we'll go into all the details again. And this is one of the more like classic mythological stories in Norse mythology, which is really fun. Basically, they show up to a giant's castle and he's just like, I'm going to challenge you to all these competitions. And so he asks Loki, he's like, what's your skill? And Loki's like, I can eat faster than anybody. <laughs> and so he brings out this massive trough of food and um, like <laughs> you get a shot of it. Massive oh, trough God of food. Uh-huh. And Loki's just like chowing, Fuck. like chowing down. And he's going up against this other dude and the other dude beats him. And because yes, Loki did eat all the flesh, but the other guy actually ate the bones. Oh, God damn. And his half of the trough that the food came in. He ate the wood. <laughs> So then he talks to the little man server. He's like, I can run really fast. He's like, all right, well, race this little giant. And then the giant just completely obliterates him, basically, <laughs> speed wise. He's like, what about you, Thor? And Thor's like, I can drink. There is no drink. I cannot drain. And they bring a Viking horn. And he he's like taking drops. And they're like, oh, it's, it's you know, you barely moved it. Ha ha. And he's just like, Thor's like, this is bullshit. Um, then he's like, I bet you can't even pick up my cat. He's like, I will pick up your cat. Which leads to this amazing panel. Oh, shit. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and Thor actually picks, gets one paw off. Nice. And then the giant gets really serious. He's like, all right, that's enough. Get out. <laughs> Basically, no, no, no. They have a wrestling match, too. That's right. With an old lady who takes him down without even trying. So um, he kicks him out and he basically reveals to them, this was all an illusion. And he talks about what basically what, what happened was... He's like, you're incredibly powerful. You need to get the fuck out of my house, basically. <laughs> he said, uh, like, um, in the previous issue, they, they chilled with a giant, and Thor kept hitting him in the head with the hammer to try to wake him up. Mm-hmm. This giant was like, that was me in disguise. <laughs> and when you hit me in the head with the hammer, I used my magic to put a mountain between us because I could feel the force of your blows. He's like, this is the mountain. Oh, goddamn. So Thor just wrecked a mountain with his hammer, basically. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then he's like, he asks Loki, he's like, uh, the, f- the food thing was actually, the thing eating was fire, fire itself. It just burned it all. Oh, like, shit. Like, it's the embodiment of fire. Yeah. And then the when the kid in the race, he was racing thought. Oh. You can't run, run faster than thinking, you know? Uh-huh. And then the, the drinking horn... Um, he said, what did, you, what did I do last night? He's like, he did the impossible. He's like, the end of the drinking horn was in the deepest part of the sea. You drink enough to, to make, take the ocean level down, to make tides. Because of you, Thor, the seawater will rise and ebb forevermore. <laughs> this is the origin of tides in Norse mythology. Uh-huh. That's really cool. And the cat was the world serpent. And there's what it really looks like. Oh, no shit. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> and he said, did you, see, did you feel the earth rumble when you lifted it? It's because it was the world serpent, basically. <laughs> And then the old lady is death. Uh, no, it's age. It's old age. It's old age. Mm-hmm. And no one can, you know, beat old age. And they get teleported, teleported out. Cool thing is, is the next one is going to be about a giant eagle, and they're bringing Honer back, their their um, manservant. So it'd be another fun one like that. But yeah, this is a really classical, like mythological story where you know multiple heroes, big challenges. Each one specializes in a certain thing. It's very Finnish. It's a very okay. Finnish uh, mythology thing. I'm big on fin- Finnish mythology, so it was like the, like the almost like this was more serious, but it reminded me of like the the Thor and Loki Double Trouble comics that we read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically, little adventures. <laughs> There's a really good Thor book. I'm gonna have to have you read. I'm gonna have to remember the name of it though. It was a mini, and 
Thor and the Warriors Three had to travel around and gather legendary weapons. Ooh, okay. Including grass cutter, the katana, yeah, um, the spear slaughter, which has to be bathed in blood or like attack on its own. Uh, so like, wait, when did they come so out? Cool. <sighs> Early two thousands, I want to say. Oh, okay, it sounds, it sounds awesome. It. Yeah, it was really really good and yeah so dope like ah we gotta read that sometimes so anyways yeah uh but anyways enough about thor uh let's talk about killer queens number two yes putting the sass in assassin (laughs) yes brought to us by david boer who wrote the script and created uh art by claudia balboni colors by harry saxon letters by lucas gattoni um this is such a wonderfully gay romp through space i absolutely love this book absolutely (laughs) It's unapologetically gay. And I, <laughs> yeah. I adore that. Here on Bi Visibility Day, I give this a thumbs up. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I love I love that, you know, he's just relentlessly hitting on this dude. Yep. Like I, I it reminded me of somebody and I couldn't quite place it. Like from another comic, just the way he was just like, Yeah. <laughs> like he's into it. Like and he was. That's the he best was. part. <laughs> he's just he's just quiet. So <laughs> And they just basically make the plan to get out. Um, it wasn't much of a plan, to be honest. It's basically get taken in front of the leader and then fight everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so they basically talked a bunch of shit, which is great. Great speech, you know, just I like tyrant explained fascism to a fascist. Oh, my fascist. God. It's a great part. Yeah. And then the two dudes make out for a diversion. He does the first one. He's like, you call that? You want a real diversion? And he dips him, and I'm like, hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, cool fight scene. Lots of fun. I like the stairs. Like, there's just way too many stairs, and they're oh, all sure. over the place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> funny. Yeah. And then they meet up. Um, th- basically, they blow their way out, and his new boyfriend <laughs> uh, is now has a very uh, built lady friend with him. That I assume is going to be for the other main For Alex, yep. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, dude, I really dug this. Um, Max and Alex are great. Just It's just so much fun. They're so fucking good together. Like, I mean, being partners in this, like, s- yeah. space adventure. They just sass back and forth. It's just, yeah. I really dig it. So. I love the, the, the double page spread right before the, the stairs joke, where you get, like, the shot of, like, each of them, but then, like, their whole, like, fight scenes come across. Oh, yeah. it, was oh, such, yeah. it was such a great layout. Yeah, definitely really dig this book really love this book it should not be four issues yeah maybe we'll get a second volume i hope so <laughs> i mean we said the same thing about canto just saying yeah that's true <laughs> so, all right moving on it's time to open up the vault vault oh. comic books oh man good catchphrase everybody <laughs> the warning <laughs> so, um vampire the masquerade 10 has it been like four months since we got one of these books? It almost seems like you're right. I had to remind I myself what, what was happening. Like, I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but man, I'm happy to get it. Written, main story by Tim Seeley, drawn by Dev Maya Promenick and Corin Howe. The Anarch Tales, written by Teeny and Blake Howard, drawn by Nathan Gooden, and with coloring overall by Addison Duke and letter by And World. Oh my God, it all comes down to it. Yeah. Cecily. I love Cecily Bain. I've Cecily said it in the Bain. past. Yeah. She's the best. She's the absolute best. And it all comes down to it. A lot of people die. A lot of vampires die. And it's just, it's just really interesting. I, I like that Calder makes it. Uh huh. Cause Calder is such a piece of crap. And I just love having him around still. He's wonderful. Um, I I don't really mind that Aaron didn't make it because Aaron wasn't really all that big of a deal to me. Aaron Running Bear. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh no, she's gonna make it. That's right. She did the Wolves tease. That's right. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's cool. That's gonna be exciting. Um. And of course, we got to see the uh, the Tremere, um, like do his full thing, like go fucking blood crazy and just rip blood out of all these guys and that just just the spread that was i know insane the way the blood just flows out of him like tentacles or almost like wings in a way the way he's just like floating up yeah it's just incredible but of course everything comes down to cecily and Allie. 
And a really surprisingly somber and or not somber, but a really surprisingly emotional moment, I would say. Mm-hmm. We get to see what happens and but we do we do we? That's a question. Because <laughs> that is teased a little bit. But in the end, the new prince of the two Twin Cities is Cecily Payne for some reason. Well, she, she didn't want, it. right? <laughs> she's like, she's the person who doesn't want it. But the, isn't that like an old saying? Like the the person, the person who should lead should be the person who doesn't want to lead. Yeah, like like <laughs> so they're not like corrupted. But yeah, and then we get a really cool Anarch tale at the end, which is awesome too. Um, oh yeah, which also kind of teases into the wolves. So. I like how these stories kind of weave in and out of each other. Mm -hmm. And I really dug that this one actually uh, dug into the Vite, the, the special, um, the special bloods that you can drink, which um, all of the books or the cards for at the end. Oh yeah. Yeah. Different abilities. You you get different things that you could do. So, um, so it kind of teases, it kind of shows that off. I like that. The, the second story seems to feature like a game mechanic every time to tell us about yeah. which i thought was pretty cool so or to introduce a clan we're not used to whereas the first story can stay centered on the same main cast this one can i introduce characters and just show us little bits which is really cool i loved this this was cool i cannot wait to see where they're going if they're going to do if they're going to do like a werewolf uh crossover maybe because we know we have a big crossover coming up with vampire right the, the world of darkness so yeah what if they open the world of darkness and they make a werewolf their forsaken book who oh my god dude fuck yeah span span it out like that yes that would be so cool yeah so dug it really really dug this book anything you wanted to add about it this page i love how when she when she finally does it the positioning is just so Mm -hmm. biblical that it just makes it just like like so cool for like like the aspect of like all like vampirism and stuff it's like an oil painting yeah right yeah (laughs) oh god yeah it's so good all right, now we're going to go over to Image. Now, as we talk about Image, we each have some solos, so we're going to do what we did last time, because that was fun, but yeah. we alternate. Nice. Uh, so I'm going to start with Frontiersman number one. So I got this cover. It's the A cover, I'm pretty sure, but still. Uh-huh. I don't know how much you looked at this, but... I, I, I just saw it at the stores, but I didn't flip through it. <laughs> yeah. Written by Patrick Kinlan, art by Marco Ferrari, letters by Jim Campbell. So... Basically, this is a story, and it's actually very beautiful. It's a very beautiful book. Uh, lots of this forest kind of style. Ooh, and he, wow. he's up okay. in the Pacific Northwest. Nice. And Frontiersman used to be a hero, a superhero. But he retired, and he lives out in the middle of nowhere now, and he basically lives off the land. Also, one of his enemies apparently uh, made a whole bunch of robots, like a couple hundred robots, and sent them after him. So every once in a while, a robot shows up. He has to beat. So the very first thing you see after that that is him just behead a robot, basically. Ooh, okay. And of course, he recycles it and takes all the parts out of it because hey, now I don't have to go to the, go to town for these parts. You know, a dude shows up and is basically like, "Hey, I'm a climate change activist. I would like you to help us to stand by us in this you know fight." And he's just like, "I'm an old man." And he's like, well, no, we don't need you to fight, fight. We just need you to basically lend your name to our cause. We're going to build the tree for it. We're going to sit in a tree they're trying to cut down. And he's like, I guess. Uh, I don't know, man. It's not really my thing. You know? And the, oh, and the trees they're cutting down are um, the redwoods in the Northwest Pacific. So. Um, so he's like, I'm not sure. And then this is another one where we kind of meet a couple goofy characters, um, including. Uh, one of his friends who's a, a doctor, he's a professor, and he kind of got like the atom. He shrinks and stuff like that. So. Mm-hmm. And he basically is thinking about it, and he gets guilted into it, and yeah, he climbs up into it at the end, and he's going to be a climate change activist. And uh. it's really interesting because I love the way the letter opens up at the end, which is, Frontiersman is a result of our shared enthusiasm and blah, blah. A love letter to yada, yada. Look, you know the deal. <laughs> like, it's just like, it's like we're not going to, basically, we're not going to preach to you about climate change. Like, <laughs> like you know what's going on, basically. And then he just kind of talks about, like, the whole idea of uh, superhero books in a comic format and how um, Marvel and DC are so complex and interwoven and they're so, you know, almost a century deep at this point. You know what I mean? 
Uh, so, like, he talks about the second image boom and when that, you know, when that happened and, like, what that did to the industry and stuff. It's just really cool. And he talks about a lot of the superhero books that aren't Marvel and DC, like Invincible, Astro City, Black Hammer. Okay. Um, you know, and so he's just talking about, like, this is kind of what we want to do. You know, we want to be the best. We're going to start from the beginning. It's not going to be like a, you know, a really complex narrative that, um, again, 40 years of history like Marvel and DC. That's not how this works. So, uh, but I thought it was really cool. I thought it was a lot of fun uh, building a lot of characters. Climate change is a very important thing to me. So, yeah, I really dug it. I'm looking forward to more of it. So, let's way, switch to you, Stillwater, number 10. <laughs> Stillwater. <laughs> By Chip Zarsky, uh, oh, created uh, with Chip Zarsky, co-created also with uh, Ramon K. Perez as the artist, and Mike Spicer as the colorist, and Russ Wooten doing the letters. Okay, number ten. We find out. I mean, so many people are like have been like scheming and trying to like, in the in the town of Stillwater where nobody can really die, everybody's basically immortal. Um, it's not as it's not as awesome as, as it sounds. And a lot of people have been very tired of just living this monotonous life of not being able to progress forward so much so that, that the ones that have been impacted the most is of course the children. So we get a little bit of a backstory from 91, 96, um, and then coming up to the, the beginning of the story in 2020. So in 1991, when, um, when Daniel's mom, like the like the one the one guy that got to grow old at, outside of town, when she first had to abandon the kid, um, and obviously she's distraught in her own home, the sheriff's son, and we've seen him around before, and he he has been kind of a player um, in the story. Uh, back in ninety one, he's a, he kind of goes into um, her house and he's like, "Oh, Mrs. Quinn, like Grandpa wanted wanted to, to let you know that game night's about to start, so if you want to come over now." And she's just like, yeah, no, I'm honestly, I'm not that, not that into it tonight. Maybe, maybe another night. And he doesn't start like prodding, but he just, he just starts being curious. And he's like, oh, are you so, oh, Tommy, are you so sad about Tommy? And she's like, I'll always be sad about Tommy. And she's like, but you know, I'm just having a little faith and everything at like that. And she leaves him with, um, just know, but we will always know that Tommy is in a better place. And obviously we know what, we know what that, that saying means, but also just the fact that at least Tommy's not in this town. Mm. Jump another five years forward. And it's like the hit the, the kid's dad, the sheriff, he basically busts down uh, the town's lawyer's door. And uh, cause like he found, he found out that the lawyer has been slipping, not messages about the town, but like sending letters and money to people from the town's relatives outside of town, which is, I guess like one of the big no, no's one of the big rules that you're not supposed to break. So he gets taken to the edge of town, meaning an actual death. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, his son, was kind of lingering around and was waiting for him for him to take the guy, the lawyer away so he can go in and snoop in for the lawyer's uh, files, specifically Tommy's just to figure out what, what's been going on, going on with him or just figure out like what, what happened to this kid and why not be here with us? We find out that it's fucking, it's this kid that the sheriff's, the, the sheriff's son that started everything. He's the one that sent like that bogus letter to Tommy. So that him and his friend can come over the, the friend coming with Tommy wasn't part of the plan, but just to get Tommy into town so that because the kids are really our, our future. <laughs> and this little kid was smart enough to be like, okay, if we can bring this guy, this guy back 20 years later, um, it can change everything. It can change this whole town. Because again, like the adults have just stayed frozen, not even caring. They're like, cool. Like, I guess like our kids are always going to be kids, but not necessarily thinking about like the implication of what that would do to their psyche. Mm-hmm. Again, these kids, these kids end up being little geniuses, and going all the way back to the first issue when Tom, or when Tommy's friend is witnessing like the two kids playing on the rooftop, and one of them pushes the other kid, and we right. thought like, oh, it's part of the twisted town. Like they, the kids don't care that they can't die. No, this is part of the, this, this little shit's plan. Like they wanted them to see them so wow. that they to watch them fall, so that, so that the now so that the, so that the Tommy and his friend can start asking questions about the town because the town was just really just gonna be like, hey, cool, not nice to see you, and go go away now. But now mm-hmm. now that they saw this, they're gonna fucking stay and enter the next eight issues uh, up to this point. So, what end up happening here? Um, and now it's like uh, in 2021, uh, there's like a little mission where some kids like saw something weird happen in this like um, outskirts cabin. They get the kid um, and they go investigate. 
and it's like yeah no we saw like we saw the, like the like these big uh big people and it's like oh they're probably just like hunters that got lost around here it's like no 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 like they fucking have big big guns not hunting guns and they were just like hella hella shredded mm-hmm. and it, it turns out it was um his dad's buddy like those marines that he brought over to kind of overtake the town mm-hmm. they get to jump on the kids but again this little shit is just so smart he lives in, like he starts talking back at them and like in a way where he's using his dad against them where like he's <laughs> where like he's 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 like throwing his dad under the bus where it's just like, you know, I, I know that my dad brought you guys here. I can definitely see like by the, by you guys jargon. Um, I know who you guys are. Isn't it kind of fucked up that my dad let you guys get old while he kind of stayed here in this paradise. And it really starts getting some, cause like they really kind of like went like now they're just like hella older. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of like, he's able to kind of turn them now on the sheriff enter now. And there's a, big uh, an- an- another big town meeting in a bar now and of course uh, G- G- uh, galen is-, is his name he's the one that steps up and is basically now like he kicks over like the the chair that's on top of the mound and he just like just squats down and he's like all right this is this is what's gonna happen now and for some reason everybody's kind of cool with it <laughs> they are like nobody's really tied up like the the, the adults aren't really tied up to where like they have to listen to them everybody's just like start- is just sitting there and like listening to how it's gonna work out now and yeah, there's going to be a lot of rule changes. <laughs> um, and what's happened is like, so we're still going to be doing like the judge. Like there's going to be three people that are going to be um, on trial at, the, at this moment. The judge for being a shitty judge, his dad and uh, Tommy for basically for, for coming back. Uh, <laughs> and so the judge, uh, so, but he still appoints the judge to um, do the, uh, what was like what the answer to like the uh to the trial for for these people it gives them all like bogus stuff like basically like the um, because the the lady sheriff brought an outsider she's basically gonna get six weeks underground the sheriff because he plotted a coup they're gonna take him to the edge and be executed and then for tommy or for in this case daniel um is like because he came over um and because of the circumstances he'll only get one week underground and this is where Galen is like, those are terrible oh, verdicts. Those are terrible verdicts. Oh, okay, I, was, I still had no idea what you were going on. <laughs> yeah, then Galen is like, those are terrible verdicts, overruled. Here's what's really going to happen. <laughs> and he starts uh, he, he starts demanding his own verdicts. And what's going to happen now is like, yeah, maybe Tommy's still going to be a, a week underground. But now people can actually leave. Like there's going to be, and not all at once. So it doesn't get too crazy with everybody to start aging out. Uh, mm-hmm. But the kids... The kids are going to be able to leave. The fucking baby that that we got traumatized with last issue, he'll the baby. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it, it, that part was just so crazy. Uh, the baby will actually get to like leave the the barrier and get to just like start developing. Um, so yeah, and and it's like and it's still like almost like in a bittersweet moment, uh, bittersweet fashion because uh, Tommy's mom's like basically Tommy and his mom still can't be together. She's basically one of the adults that has to leave with the kids. So it's kind of like ah, what the fuck's going to happen? Um, and in the end, at least like we do get some, uh, happy, uh, uh, end on a happy note, uh, the, the judge, he starts having his one last line where it's like, it is, it is, it isn't easy, you know, leading and he starts being like, oh, blah, blah it's going to be harder than, you know, whatever the, the terror about everything is going to sink in. And then you see a gun being passed behind him because uh, it's like the sheriff is like is standing over him. You see a gun being mm. passed over him. And fucking Galen is the one that takes the shot, the little kid, and just shoots, <laughs> shoots the old judge. And it's almost like every it's a shot of like everybody hearing um, the that last shot. And it's like, and the last word, the last line is like, it's uh, Tommy's monologue. It's like, but in Stillwater, how far is too far? So it's like, ooh, okay, cool. We do get to see some changes, kind of st- some stuff for the better. We didn't really see anything kind of like overly bad stuff. Maybe Galen is dip, double down on like, I mean just to fucking take a shot, take someone's life at that age uh, would be kind of crazy. Maybe that'll be like the new villain, but he's not really being like this, like authoritarian figure, even though he kind of was, but it was mostly because he was just done with everybody's bullshit for like over 20 years now. And him being a kid for 20 years, it's kind of like that. That was all messed up. So yeah, it, it, it was a, it was a solid issue. Nice. So it is ongoing. That's not the end. Oh no, that's not the end. It should not. It sounded end. kind of like an end. So I want to make sure. Oh no, no, no. All right, great. Well, my next book is The Old Guard, Tales Through Time, number six. 
Uh, so we got two stories. The first one, written by Vita Ayala, art by Nicholas Scott, with colors by Annette Kwok. And the second story, written by Greg Rucca, art by Leandro Fernandez, and colors by Daniel Miwa. Uh, letters are done for everything by Jody Wynn. So once again, we got two stories from the old guard. This is the last issue. Ooh, okay. And in this one, uh, there's a museum in France, and one of the guys, he sees a doll, a little doll that in, in a display case from the war. Um, I really enjoyed the art for this issue. Who did it? Uh, it was Nicholas Scott, I think. Okay. Yeah. So, like, you can see, like, the character designs here. Oh, okay, yeah. It's done really, really nicely. Solid shading, yeah. Yeah, really, like, I like the features, the facial features and stuff, really drawn well. So, basically, they have to break in and steal the doll, and they're not really talking about why. It's the two, it's the two girls. And they steal it, and it's because their fellow immortal, it's the last thing his kid gave him, like as he was taken away Aww. to be put in, put in prison or no, to be put in the, the military, excuse me. And the kid gives, gives it to him and says, promise you won't forget us, Papa. And he's like, never. And then it's him holding it. And he's like, thank you. It's just really sweet. So, uh, but yeah, that was really cool. And the second story um, was, was kind of fun. Um, so basically uh, Isaac, one of the guys is living out in the, wo- in the woods now, which is, this is funny because I just talked about frontiersmen, but he basically comes into town to get supplies. And whenever he comes in, he's always like, he comes in town because his bones are hurting. He knows there's a freeze coming. So he needs to get supplies. So like the whole town is literally like, Oh, Isaac's here. Freeze is coming next week and stuff like that. He goes out, he goes, he goes out in the middle of nowhere. He's trapping some, some hares. He's gathering them and a bear attacks him. And the bear just shreds him and starts trying to steal his rabbits and then he gets back and he's like, hey, come back here, <laughs> which is great. And he's like, drop it, drop it. And the bear drops it. He's like, good. All right, come on. I could do with the company. And that's it. It's just like a goofy story about the bear. All right. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed this. And it really gives me a cool perspective into these characters. And it kind of makes me really wonder what the next movie is going to be like. Ooh, okay. So I'm very excited. I love the old guards. So. And back to Josue. For that Texas Blood number 10. Yes, that Texas Blood by Chris Condon and Jacob Phillips. I'm pretty sure it's writer and artist, respectively, because it doesn't say. Um, So, this is the arc that's basically being told as one giant flashback. In In this issue, we only come back to the present for, like, one page. And most of this arc has been taking place, like, in the present, the being told the whole, this whole backstory. Um, yeah, it's, it's being told in a diner, and it's just, we're we're recollecting this story, this case that the sheriff of this town um, had like, experienced back in the eighties and about this, like this black family that lost both kids. The boy did die and it's, it's up to him to find the missing girl. And this is the one where that weird guy from, from LA came over um, to with like the evidence of like this cult. That's kind of like that now moved over here. Like, like he kind of followed him over here and it, at least he's the one that's kind of bringing in some leads for the for the sheriffs to kind of find this little girl. So, so yeah, the the boy dies. The our good sheriff that we've been following kind of goes over to the mom's place because he's friends with her. There's a moment at the beginning of the issue where like the, you can tell how close they were, and he's kind of like trying to, trying to console her, being like, "It's it, it's cool. There's a, we have some ideas. There's there's some leads that kind of popped up, and she explodes. Like you have ideas. You have you have these fucking leads." But you're here talking to me about them instead of being out there trying to do your, the job you're supposed to. She blows up on him. And the whole time he's just like, yeah, no, you're right. Like, I'm sorry. And uh, and he starts monologuing. That's like it, it literally sparked like this like flame in him. So, so to actually pursue this case and trying to find her. Because, yeah, it was kind of messed up that he's just like talking about it instead of doing anything about it. Um, so it goes back to the to the the station. And that's when his superior is, is always obviously going to be around. But he starts freaking out as well because he's kind of like, "All right, what the fuck is this guy still doing here?" The the L the L A news guy, and our chef is just trying to tell his boss, "There's like, you no, know, he's got some points. Like, there's some stuff that he has here that could work," and he's just not having it. He he starts telling his own story of like back in '57, we're in the '80s right now. Back in '57, there was a pretty much basically a similar a similar case, missing kids. A psychic rolls into town and says, and pretty much like gives hope uh, to the family and the and the station. That's like at, at one point, basically, 
they tell him like, yo, if you leave right now, they're at the airport, or they're crossing the border. If you leave right now, you can catch them. You'll save them. It's like, oh, and it sparked this whole joy. Guess what? The fuck it, the boy fell down their well and he was only screaming for like 50 feet away from their own home, but nobody was around because we got led to the fucking border instead. So you get why the sheriff is not in like not having it with this guy being around, but even though this guy is kind of bringing in some some truce here, so it's like kind of their budding heads that way. I was starting to suspect that maybe this sheriff might have something to do with it, but mm-hmm. I was like, fuck no, this is like a very detailed story. It's like, uh, I'll buy it, but at the same time, our sheriff is just like not letting it. I was like, cool, like fine, you're separating. I was like, you, you told me I could take 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 over this case, it's my case, so I'm, I want him involved. But he's like, no, as your superior. Fuck no. You go back to California. You go back to uh, your case. Split them. Outside the station, they're like, yeah, fuck all that noise. We're still going to do this, right? He's like, yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah, we are. So they go over to the, the where they wait at night. Oh, and also because that that night, like the the reporter guy is kind of like, yo, it's the solstice tonight. It's like, that's it's a it's a high, if, the, if this is a real call, tonight's the night where like they're really going to do the whole ritual bit. So it might be the night to find them. So they wait until the night to go over to that one house, literally in the middle of nowhere to confront him or to, to see what's up. They get there. It's a little too quiet. <laughs> Knock on the door. Nobody's answering. They literally bust in and it is pitch black in there. They're trying to navigate there. I mean, they're calling out to the girl now. It's like, fuck it. We're inside. If you can hear us call, if you can hear us call, call it out. Nothing. They kind of split ways in the house and our sheriff goes into like this one room and also, again, because like this cult also has like bat tattoos and the webbing of like their their thumb and index finger, and it's supposed to be like a like a Mayan tattoo of a comatos, this like this mm-hmm. giant bat, like adding more to their to their cult. So he goes into his one room, and as like a thunder claps, you see like this giant thing above him, mm-hmm. and it's just like what the fuck? And he and he glimpses, and he's like, and he freaks him out. <laughs> it looks and, like man bear pig. A little bit, just with wings, <laughs> just with wings. So it freaks him out. He falls on the floor, and, you just, and, he, bird. <laughs> and, he, and he just starts pointing the gun in the darkness in the air because um, he can't really see. And that's when the reporter guy like busts in the door, and he's like, "What is it? What is it?" He's like, "Oh, it's, it's fucking right there." It's it's um, and he clicks on the lights, and it's just it, it is a statue. It is a giant statue, but it looks more like of like of a Mexican statue of of, of a comatas. It didn't look. It doesn't look as sinister as as he did. Mm-hmm. So they just have like a little uh, like laughing fit because like, oh, we were just scaring ourselves here. But obviously the mission is still a girl. And then you start hearing these whoomp, whoomp, whoomp. And at first it's kind of was like, wait, what the fuck is that? It's like, it almost sounds like, and the reporter goes like, like bat wings. And he's like, well, and the show's like, well, I was going to say more like drums. And they start getting louder and louder and louder and closer. And that's literally, and then, and then that's literally kind of where it, where it leaves off. But you just get like, this like one giant monologue on like the sheriff about like, what is really hell and how like maybe there is just like more than one hell and how like maybe this is hell and we just opened the door to it going into this house it's kind of like oh shit a little sinister so i've been loving this arc so far <laughs> awesome. even though it's just like one giant backstory but it's like this little case has just been like i, I just want to see, see see it through nice all right and my last solo for image is chu number eight um this issue is so good this <laughs> made me laugh so hard okay um so written in letter by John Lehman, drawn in color by Dan Boltwood. So they pulled off this heist to get this wine that when you drink it, you go back in time. And you go back to the time when it was created is the idea. Okay. So this is them revealing another food ability someone has. When they create it and you consume it, you go back in time to that time. Nice. So uh, so she find, uh, Saffron finds out about, about this from her grandfather who has is, who is, uh, come across it in the past. And so she steals it and she drinks it and she goes back in time to like provincial France. And it's very funny because she's like wearing a nice gown and stuff. She's like, uh, basically someone says, um, something about the, Oh, there's a guy pulling a, a, a cart of cabbages. She's like, Hey, you come here. <laughs> and then, um, she's like, Hey, what's going on? What's with your vegetable cart? Is it market day? He's like market day. He's like, no, this is for, the the um the viscount the viscount the you know some fancy dude basically mm-hmm. and she's like why are you interested you want one of my cabbages she's like i want all of your cabbages like perhaps perhaps we can come to a rage she's like oh yes we absolutely can and she just knocks him the fuck out <laughs> and takes his outfit and starts pushing his cart right oh my god <laughs> so she gets to the front gate 
And the guards are there. She's like, cabbage delivery. They're like, we'll take it from here. Only soldiers, staff, and approved guests of the major or grand, grand vi- vi- viscount be on this point. She's like, you don't say. <laughs> knocks them out. Takes their outfit. Walks in. Walks up to this lady. Got a message from the mayor for his attendant staff. And she, this lady's like, I'm part of the attendant staff. Are you now? Knocks them out. Just <laughs> keeps doing outfits. It's like the most this book has made me laugh. It was making me crack up. So she's just slowly punching her way in, basically. Um, and yeah, basically she finds out that she's, um, uh, they're going to basically, the idea is to steal this painting. Mm -hmm. This, this, uh, painter then, uh, became famous later on and his painting is just sitting there and no one likes it and all this stuff. And she's like, I can go back in time and steal it and then I'll have it in the future. But then the wine runs out. So she's like, well, I need to get more now. So she goes back and, you know, to the present when she sobers up and she discovers that her entire team well, almost her entire team was taken out. Oh. So Mr. Double Cross, who's the guy who double crossed her, <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, was shot by her and killed. Monsieur Petassier is off limits because chefs are protected. He's the one that made them all the, the same little uh, <laughs> treats they had in the last issue. Mr. Getaway got away. Um, Madame Contraire, she died. Miss Cookie died. And Eddie Molay, her terrible boyfriend, was beaten nearly to death. And he's awful. And then this dude shows up and is basically like, you know, you're going to steal that painting for me or I'm going to kill your grandpa. Oh, damn. But just her punching her way up the ranks was so fucking funny to me. (laughs) Good way to tell a story. (laughs) I love her so much. So um, That's it for our solo books. Now let's move on to our shared images, which are two. I got Second Chances number two. Yes. Written by Ricky Mamone. Art by Marx, Max Bertolini, and letter by DC Hopkins. Um, God, this book is just so cool and vibrant. I just love it for being black and white. Black you know, and white yeah, it has so much like character, and it's so noir and it's so pulpy. You know, like yeah, like pulp hero style. Especially the the characters, they're kind of ridiculous. It's almost like like I don't want to say this, but. I mean, they're kind of almost... It's almost like a Metal Gear Solid story. Like, I mean, Yeah, just about. <laughs> just kind of ridiculous, like, literally sexy sniper chick and the, the, the rabbit ninja, rabbit robot ninjas and all that stuff. And it's just, you know... Like we're set in this, like, regular, almost like New York, San Francisco-style city. So, of course, of course there's going to be the, the Kabuki twins. It's kind of like another weird element to just throw in there. Yeah. I get what you're saying. How it's like a metal gear reference is like, I'm not with like the story and how complicated it is, but just the random elements that get thrown on the wall and the fact that they all just stick. <laughs> yeah. And he's, um, because it is so noir, because it is so pulpy, like snake is kind of a pulp. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Not too. Know? So that's kind of what I feel. I'm like, it's really cool. Um, we get to see him hang out with his ex-girlfriend uh, talk to her. We find out that the, the the girl from the first issue that he's saving was basically mind controlled to kill her family, which is cool because I was kind of like, I really hope they explain this because it feels weird, like it felt off, and then they immediately explain it in this issue. So I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. But no, it was a lot of fun, and we we basically promised a really cool fight scene next because they're about to fight the uh, the, the, the the there will be blood or not there will be blood <laughs> robots the bleed them dry robots right so. Yeah, which that's pretty dope. Um, that was when I got to the last page. I was like, okay, hold on, I gotta get up. I had to show Sochi this last page, and it's like the cat because of the cat. I wanted her to see the cat at the end because it's like it's literally, literally in the corner. But it's like as she's watching it, and of course, her the first thing she sees is, is the damn cat. So it's like cool. Yeah. And then I'm telling her like, it's so serious, and there's like a really cartoony cat, and I love it. The face is everything, and then I'm telling her about the elements all over this book, and she's just like, what? Like I want to read this. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I picked this up. It's so good. It is really cool. So, but it is an issue too. So um, obviously we have a long way to go with this book. Hopefully. Oh my God. I just noticed that the ads in the back are also in black and white. Cause I've been seeing some of these. Oh in other yeah. Books. The silver coin and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> huh? That's cool. Yeah, it is. <laughs> huh. All right. And our last image book is radiant black number eight. Oh boy. Uh Written by Kyle Higgins, drawn by Marcelo Costa, colored by Natalia Marquez, letter by Becca Carey. Uh, we kind of, well, basically, we bring our radiance back together in the end uh, to fight the big bad. Um, and we get, we get some like character development, some like duo character development. 
between them just kind of developing who they are, which I thought was really cool. Um, we get this awesome juggernaut moment. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> which was cool as hell. Um, and they just have a really cool fight. And I just love the radiance. They look awesome. This was also awesome. Mm-hmm. Oh, like whatever the fuck was happening. I here. want to understand these powers. Are these like give me something so I so I know how it's happening, or just to make sense? Because it's always just like, oh, that's fucking cool. I yeah. don't know how. I just know that he has black hole powers, but I need a little bit more than that. <laughs> to me, I think the I think he's because it's a black hole. I think maybe there's something on the other side that's channeling these powers to them. Oh yeah, I mean, like, yeah, we have seen those giant mechas, so it's kind of like are they yeah. almost like portaling through each other? Because a black hole is basically a rip in space time, so uh-huh. that would kind of make sense. So yeah, but I really dug this. I mean, it is it is a Sentai though. I love that. <laughs> and like, it's that was like a joke they made. But I'm like, no, that's pretty on the nose, actually. Like so much so that if it is a Sentai, because Kyle Higgins loves a Sentai, I want this antagonist to be the anti-hero fifth ranger antagonist like like the fifth sentai yeah the tommy <laughs> yeah basically yeah <laughs> let's be honest the tommy <laughs> so yeah dude but i i dug this uh, there's a lot of fun the team's kind of together now yeah you kind of see a little bit more of the power you, you see like the when you saw like the you're talking calling out the, the juggernaut suit but you see the yellow radiant like the the old guy he almost has like i'm not sure if he has like like fl- like quick powers or the way he can almost like multiply himself yeah. I would, like they're, they're all so different but they're really cool i kind of want to know what, what what was going on there too yeah he also has like a blaster ray kind of thing it looks yeah than theirs so i do like how they're all kind of unique to each other so yeah i'm excited to get to know them like that's gonna be a lot of fun mm-hmm. so. and also just and just be ready for the next issue because again i just I, I just like to peek at the, the lettering for a second just to see if the, the creators are going to give me a little bit more and they usually do um towards like just uh like the last paragraph the last sentence we'll just have something and yeah sure enough we'll be back next month for issue nine have your tissues ready it's a sad one did you see the cover and then you see the cover for the next one (laughs) (laughs) fuck yeah and and it's titled life and times is the name of that chapter too and he we know he's in a coma yeah so all right guys now we're gonna move on to dc comics now Josue was unable to get his dc books this week yeah i really wanted Uh, to but uh, I don't only I only have four. So okay, it's not going to be a big chunk, anyways. Um, I'm going to start with my surprise of the week for DC. Ooh, okay. Uh, which is Batman's Secret Files Miracle Molly, Ooh, okay. uh, written by James Tynan the Fourth, drawn by Danny, colored by Lee Lorridge, and lettered by Tom Napolitano. A Danny book? Okay, I might just get this just for Danny. This, <laughs> this book, all you would have to do is literally insert a silver coin in here somewhere and it would fit into the silver coin f- feel. No shit, for real. <laughs> so like it's it's not it doesn't feel like a normal DC book in the least to me. Wow, okay. So I'm excited. It's about this girl and she's married and well it opens up but at the end but we'll come back to that. So it's just just this mousy kind of girl. You can see her right here. Okay. And you can see it's like almost like Legends of Dark Knight art style. Mhm. Like the old old Batman style, like late eighties, early nineties, and <laughs> she does, she does have a Tim Sale approach when she's doing the a Gotham. Yeah, I see it. So basically, she works for a robotics company, and she's like a low level tech there, and they don't listen to her because she's a girl and all this, and she really wants to be heard. And her husband's kind of a dick, and he's just like, you know, honey, maybe, maybe, you know, basically trying to talk her into her his life so they're like oh maybe we should have kids and she's like i want to really work on my career and he's like yeah but it's been years he's starting to push her and they keep going to the same montage over and over where it's just her sitting there eating her sitting there on the couch with them them having sex with her with having a really bored face look on her face Mm. and it keeps coming back throughout the entire issue and it's like it's uh there's a speech over it from somebody she found online because she's a she's kind of a computer hacker she has like a computer cave she goes to in her room and he's saying stuff like isn't there part of you that just wants to scream every day that feels the weight of the broken system being thrust upon your shoulders that you know will never make your life any better but what options are there and it's just like it's made you helpless and all this stuff and again it just keeps montaging montaging her life over and over and then it's they're at dinner with his parents and that's when they have the whole conversation about like, you should have kids. He's right. like, maybe we can, you know, take out your computer cave and put it in a nursery. And she's like, like really annoyed by this. What right? the fuck? 
How about yeah. we take out your fucking man cave and make it a nursery? And she keeps trying to push with her boss, being like, hey, I have some suggestions that will help. And then her husband's like, hey, why don't you just walk up to walk up in there like during a meeting? And, you know, when he can't stop you and just present your ideas. So she does that and she gets fired. Ooh. And then she's about to leave and he's like, or she's like, that's fine. I'll take my designs to a smaller, you know, robotics firm and try there. And the guy's, the boss is like, no, 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 no. He, he reaches over and takes her notepad with all of her ideas in it. And he's <gasps> like, you know, in the contract, oh, everything no. you develop with us belongs to us. No, dear. And so he's going to take credit to, for all of her inventions, basically. Uh, and he later says, wow, these are really good. I'm going to make a lot of money off this, basically. Bastard. <laughs> yeah. And so then she comes in to steal it back, and he's like physically assaulting her. And she ends up hitting him over the head, and he, he bleeds. I'm guessing he dies. He was bleeding from the head. So. Okay. She's freaking out. She goes to find the guy that gave the speech online. And he basically says, you know, I'll, I'll basically erase everything that's happened to you at this point, And you'll be your purest version is what it is. Mm-hmm. And so he does it. She comes back and she names herself Miracle Molly, which is what was on her um, notepad. And then it cuts back to the beginning, which is her robbing her husband and his parents. Oh, And he's like, honey, it's me. She's like, I have no idea who you are and I don't care. So that's what she looks like now. Oh, God damn. Yeah, dude. This was really good. Like, it's got that really dark, like, oh, just sinister, like, dread thriller to it. Like, oh, I loved it. I literally just want to get it for the Danny art, but now I'm like, I'm hella invested in the story. It is a one shot. So it's, oh, cool. like, you know, it's not like you're going to be doing much with it. So, but they're doing a lot of cool one shots, introducing characters, really developing characters like Clown Killer mm-hmm. and stuff. So that brings me to my next one, which is Aquaman the Becoming. Oh, one. nice. So I did get, of course, the sexy cover. Yes. But I also got the deluxe cover. Because, <laughs> of course. So, yeah, Ooh, so. I like it. This book was fantastic. Uh, okay. I cannot wait. It is one of six. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why DC can't just give good characters on goings. So, um, DC credits, where are you? At the very end. There we go. Uh, written by Brandon Thomas. Penciled by Diego Olertegue. Um, inked by the best name in comic books, and I stand by it, Wade Von Grand B- Raw Badger. <laughs> uh, colored by Adriana Lucas and lettered by Anne World. Um, so basically, it's Jackson training to become the new Aquaman. Mm-hmm. Um, he's taking over for Arthur eventually, and he's like training. So Arthur builds basically a danger room <laughs> and is training him. And so it opens with Jackson on Apocalypse. The rest of the Justice League is down, and he's like, Dark side's there. There's a mother box at the bottom of that ravine. It'll bring you back to Earth to warn them. At the bottom of the ravine is a lake. Stay longer than a few minutes and the acid water burns through your skin. And you're about to be chased by a swarm. And he's like, what? This is bullshit. I can't do all that. He, he's like, I can't do all that, Arthur. And, Aquaman, and Arthur goes, Aquaman can. <laughs> like, Fine. He runs. He jumps off. And they get this awesome page. Where oh, he dives just diving. The cool. And there's the mother box right there. Down the uh-huh. He gets it beats it and then later on he's like bragging that he beat it and he's like uh something like do you think batman could do it he said um he's batman you really think he hasn't done it already eight million <laughs> times <laughs> like, I was like, yeah mara shows up and they, they talk about andy curry and they keep hinting that she's gonna be the best of all of them mm-hmm. which is true by the way uh, so <laughs> um jackson goes up sees his mom he does some adventuring on on the uh, dry land, he, he meets a cute boy, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you see a Teen Titans video chat, which is pretty funny. Oh, nice. Um, it's uh, it's uh, Starfire, Beast Boy, Raven, and Kid Flash. And uh, they're basically doing this. And they're like, where is he? It's like, oh, he's fighting someone. He's like, who? The human flying fish? That's not real. And they're basically <laughs> all looking it up and stuff. And Starfire's like, if he does not arrive in the next five minutes, I will be leaving because <laughs> like, she's the headmistress. So, um, and then he pops like, "Hey guys, sorry, <laughs> like, <laughs> sorry about that." Like, what happened to him? He's like, "Well," and there's this picture of him just kicking the dude in the face as hard as he can. Nice. <laughs> so, but it's a lot of fun. And he basically, in the end, he goes to train some more. And someone in Atlantean armor, who looks a lot like Ocean Master, in my uh, opinion, yeah, shows up. And hands him his ass. Ooh. And then he gets attacked. Basically gets knocked out of the building. And the Atlantean guard surrounds him and arrests him. Now these are all like his friends. Yeah. So we don't know what's happening there. Mm. So this is great. Great book. Wonderful. 
should everyone should pick it up. I love the, begin- the part in the beginning. It's like, yeah, we should have put you on hard mode. See how you do. Yeah. <laughs> Next up is Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. Uh, oh, damn. Geez. Hella serious. Dude, these art is just so gorgeous. Um, like this book, visually, this is probably my favorite DC book. Oh, that's cool. Except for maybe Nightwing. And it oh, really yeah. depends on what kind of mood I'm in. Because Nightwing, Nightwing's just traditionally very pretty mm-hmm. this is artistically gorgeous like oh, it's nice. just completely different um but written by tom king uh drawn by bill quiz evley colors by matthias lopes and letter- lettering by clayton cowles so uh, when we left off supergirl was trying to find the guy that killed crypto or hurt crypto poison crypto trying to hunt him down across the galaxy he joined a group of raiders who were just pillaging and killing everybody this entire book is her going from planet to planet with her new sidekick chick Mm -hmm. basically finding decimated planets and like soul survivors burying people and they'll help it's really grim but again it's done in that story style of it's her her friend that's with her writing her journal after everything that happened so writing like the legends of supergirl kind of thing Mm -hmm. and it was just really dope and there's some really amazing moments like Basically, everywhere they go, Supergirl helps the survivors in some way. Uh, one guy was trying to bury hundreds of people, so she literally digs all the graves for him. Oh, goddamn. Oh, Yeah, like, it's just like, uh. But this one's the one that got me. This gigantic creature. So you can see her down there. Oh, yeah. And she's like, uh, she says, hit me. She says, you are small. I am large. It will hurt. She's like, no, it won't. I swear I'll be fine. Just pretend I'm one of the people who did this to your family. She's like, why should I do this? She's like, what are you scared? Is that it? Come on, hit me. She's like, I'm not scared. You're small. I'm large. She's like, you're not large. If you were large, you would have stopped them. All you are is fucking small. Ooh. And then the creature just smashes her. <laughs> and just beats the shit out of her. And then the creature realizes what's happening and starts crying. Mm. And basically, it was a mother who lost her entire family to these raiders. And she, she, couldn't, she couldn't let herself mourn. Because she was just holding up so much anger, and when she when Supergirl let her let it out on her, she was able to actually open up and start. Crying. Oh my god, it's actually really beautiful. I know it's fuck, dude. This book is incredible. Yeah, to give it to give her that push to just start taking the next step forward. So at least just being okay. Like fuck. Oh god, it's so beautiful. And then there's there's one where they um, the last planet they go to in the book. She just put. We found ourselves on planet Ekvik, which carries a reputation for one of the most peaceful places in the universe. The monks of Ekvik sat still when the, when the brigands came. They chanted their gods, and the Vaders fell on them like rain. And uh, Supergirl's like, I have to go. She's like, I'm going to scream. I can't scream here. If I scream, she's like, it'll be too much. Everything that's left will break. I can't be here. She flies out into space. And there's this incredible monologue uh, for, the, for the narration I'm going to read. Mm-hmm. It was just like, okay. You see, what is not well understood about the daughter of Krypton is that her power was not one of action, but one of restraint, endurance, and passion. She did not choose to fire a beam from her eyes, or breath of ice, or run faster than a speeding bullet, or any of her well-documented miracles. No, she held back her heat vision to look you in the face. She warmed her breath to converse with you. She slowed herself to walk by your side. Every moment of every day, she suppressed the forces churning inside her. All the energy of a dead world that's strained against her many barriers internally demanding to be released. I believe this effort hurt her. I believe she will. She lived her life in pain. And it goes on, but she literally flies into the sun to scream. Oh just, my god! Just to scream would hurt everybody. And it's just like, dude, this book isn't so good. Like Tom King, man. You and me have had our differences in the past. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this is so good. Four of eight, by the way. Oh, okay ongoing please and give this artist more work please <laughs> so but of course we're gonna close off with nightwing um, yes also i didn't get it but please don't hold back on spoilers that we would actually talk about okay so with nightwing uh there's a little bit of a change in the creative team this week oh okay i think it's temporary though uh written by tom taylor drawn by robbie rodriguez mm. colored by adriano lucas and letter by wes abbott um, the art is perfectly fine. I really enjoy it. <laughs> okay. so, and we still have the same colorist. Okay. That, that's the, that blue. That, blue that magic blue. <laughs> so basically the story here is that Nightwing's like, all right, well, I announced I'm going to save Bloodhaven, so it's time to do that. Oh, and, oh cover. Oh, that does the variant. Nice. Yeah. So um, he's like, time to save Bloodhaven. 
And then he gets a distress call from Oracle from Gotham. He's like, damn it. Damn <laughs> so it. I gotta go to Gotham. <laughs> so he goes to Gotham, and we know from Fear State, because this is part one of Fear State for Nightwing. Okay. We know from Fear State, Oracle was hacked. <laughs> and so, oh, and also his dog, Haley. Mm-hmm. Bite like, hmm, Haley, you up for Bitewing? Yeah, we know. We know what that dog's name is supposed to be. The dog's sleeping here. And he's like, hey, you want to have a sleepover? And the dog's eyes just. <laughs> you want to go out? Side. Well, no, he's, he's gonna leave him with someone so he goes to the neighbor and he's like hey i have to head to gotham would you she's like kids you want to watch Haley for the night and then the dog is just gone from his hands immediately <laughs> and the dogs or the kids are playing with the dog and it's this great line where he's like um he goes what happened she's like you brought a puppy within 20 feet of my children <laughs> and she goes don't worry i'm sure she'll fare better than the goldfish he goes what happened to the goldfish and one of the kids goes what it deserved <laughs> oh, oh my god <laughs> it was so grim i was like what the fuck <laughs> it was so weird i loved it um but basically he gets to gotham and the magistrate is taking over gotham so he's having to sneak around he can't like the drones are flying everywhere and everything he's trying to hide he's in crime alley and he gets jumped Ooh. by a bunch of magistrate dudes right and he realizes he's like there's too many i gotta i gotta give up and so he puts his hands up and then one of them goes, huh, what's that? He goes, that is a shadow of a bat. Uh, uh, and then him and Batman fight together. New Batman. No, this is this is Bruce. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they have this awesome coordinated fight. Nice. Where they're just doing stuff, like, perfectly timed with each other. Slip into their old patterns, they say. Like, uh-huh. And they just fight. And then that's when Batman tells him, like, hey, she's hacked. It's not going to work. Uh, they have to like flee through the sewers and stuff. There's also an awesome part where they're running and they open fire and Batman does this awesome, like wrap his cape <gasps> around Dick. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So that, that was just cool. The imagery is really good. Um, but yeah, he's basically trying to get, Oh, and also God, DC, you're drawing you're, I mean, you're writing Batman so well lately. I got to tell you, <laughs> um, he basically saved Dick and Dick's like, that was appreciated. He's like, I watched my parents die in that alley. I wasn't going to let it happen to my son. Oh, I was like, Oh, <laughs> I was going to say like, how many times do people just do, do the, the bad family just end up in crime alley. It just <laughs> seems like, it doesn't seem like a straight street. It just seems like a dead end, like half a block. They actually make a joke about it. Okay. They good. Actually make a joke about it being named crime alley. <laughs> He's like, what if they change it to lawful lane? Would there be a problem? <laughs> like, <laughs> it just seems like they always end up, they happen to end up in and around crime alley when it's not really like Batman being like, this is where my parents died. <laughs> yeah. So Oracle's down, but he's managed to find Barbara. And he's like, you know, oh, we'll use walkie-talkies because the tech's down. We'll go low tech, right? He's like, here, walkie-talkies. Just tell me where to look. She's like, no. The system I built is being used to hurt my fr- city and my friends, my family. <gasps> this is my fight. Fuck yeah, dude. When I tell you, I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love me some Barbara Gordon. God damn, do I love me some Barbara Gordon. And that is a great outfit, motivation. Just check out the outfit. Like, yeah, it's really practical and awesome looking. Like, and she's got the she got the Nightwing staff and like, yeah. Ah. I was gonna say like it, it's actually a really cool like a motivation because like it's, it's, uh, like people already display like oh, she's Batgirl, but she's actually Oracle. She should be Oracle. That is a great motivation. to just don the suit again, and, and, yeah, and for, for an Oracle, Oracle reason, her. yeah, for an Oracle reason, that's so cool. Yeah, I loved it. I cannot wait. There's two more issues. Nice. Uh, Thank you for not holding are, back. I, that was yeah, awesome. I, I knew. I knew I couldn't. It was just too good. So, all right, guys, that takes us to Marvel. Yes. As always, we wrap up with Marvel. And oh god, do I have a stack? Okay. So I have a couple solos. Uh, first of all, Star Wars: Bounty Hunters number sixteen, written by Ethan Sachs, drawn by Paolo Villanelli, uh, colored by Rafe Prianto, and letter by Joe Sabino. Uh, not a lot happens in this one because it's actually an expansion of what happened in the last. War of the Bounty Hunters. Okay. Uh, where um, Dengar and Valance have been traveling together the entire time, and Valance basically goes with Boba Fett instead and leaves and leaves Dengar behind. So that was the main plot of this. Uh, not a lot to really repeat that didn't happen in the big book, but it does, if you're really into the characters, which I do really like uh, Dengar especially, mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of extra little bits that you'll really enjoy. Uh, but not a lot to really talk about to go about. But I, I'm really digging this crossover. It's been a lot of fun, and including this crazy ass fucking monster. Like just chaos. Oh, what? Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
very elder god. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I won't, I won't spend too much time on that because yeah. I also want to give a quick shout out to Black Widow number eleven. Mm. This came out last week. Okay. Um, but it sold out because it's Black Widow. Yeah. So it's impossible for me to get a copy ever. <laughs> uh, but this is written by Kelly Thompson, art by Rafael De La Torre, colors by Jordi Belair, and lettering by Corey Petit. Um, so basically, got the, they got their little crew now. It's Natasha and Yelena, and then uh, Anya uh, Corazon, and the new girl um, who uh, Lucy, who. Um, has the electric powers is kind of cursed to be stuck permanently electric now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Anya and Lucy are training together and black widow and um, Yelena find out basically kind of like a preview of a threat. Maybe we need something we need to check out and um, they're going to go to a gala. So they have to put on nice dresses and they go to the gala and they look really nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, they do. They get into a fight with a really cool villain it's it's a pair of twins. Ooh. You can see how one's really buff and one's not? Yeah. So these two share muscle mass. Oh. So the entire fight, they can literally, with a thought, send muscle mass back and forth to each other. That's so, that's so my hero academia, but it's so good. <laughs> yeah. So, like, the, and so one of them fights one of them, and so you can kind of see, like, again, Black Widow has the most underrated action scenes in comics. I don't care. Oh, what yeah, does. I love the, the comics. I've been doing this more now. Like, these, like, these motion yeah. comics, these motion scenes. Yeah. So, basically, they push the one that has all the all the muscle and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, making them draw more and more and more. Yeah. And it basically hurts the other one to the point that they're going to be harmed, so they that's what makes them stop. Oh, so, shit. Okay. But it, this is part one of a four-part crossover which I, is gonna be a lot of fun I'm curious to see what's gonna happen for you the other big thing that happened in this issue is if we remember from the beginning of this series natasha disappeared for a long time and came back or basically was found with a husband and a kid mm-hmm. and as part of the story she had to let them basically go hide they're 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 hidden somewhere she'll never find them well she just asked a guy to look into see if he can find them so <gasps> oh damn we'll see if they come back so yeah Good stuff. Next up, Gamma Flight, number four. This is four or five, so not a lot of time to spend on this because we're coming to the end. Mm -hmm. Written by Al Ewing, Crystal Fraser. Uh, Art by Alain Medina. Colored by Antonio Fabella and letter by Joe Sabino. Um, Basically, the Gamma crew is going to break into the Gamma Lab and stop Abomination and Scar. Uh, And it kind of sets that up. It's uh, Also, Rick Jones and Dell get a really cool, like, moment. Mm -hmm. Um... And yeah, it's just really, really cool. Um, God, like Scar's new look with the hands coming out of his head is really weird. Like that's one thing about this book is they're not afraid to do some crazy shit with appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, especially with like what at this point actual gamma radiation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, but they're basically trying to get in. They found a thing that can basically unhulkify all these people. Oh, and they're trying to do it, and then the ray they're using overloads and it appears Sasquatch and absorbing man get vaporized. (gasps) Oh shit. Yeah. Damn. Now what really freaked me out was I turned the page and here's the next cover. But the first thing I saw was this for death of Dr. Strange. Yeah. And I thought, Oh God, someone died. There's a funeral. And I was like, Oh, (laughs) so yeah, but we'll see. There's only one issue left. I'm curious to see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. seems like all of Al Ewing's books are ending at the same time. Oh Just damn! That out there. <laughs> no, don't go anywhere, Al. Please. <laughs> oh, no. Maybe they're tra- or getting him ready to do something else. <laughs> oh, yeah, he is, he is prepping up to start uh, Venom. I was getting worried he's, he was leaving the house. <laughs> yeah. Um. Next up is Reptile number four. Mm. So this is the end of the series. Okay. Written by Terry Bloss, uh, penciled by Anita Balam, inked by Vicar Olazaba. Uh, colored by Carlos Lopez, letter by Joe Sabino. So in the last last issue, um, Reptile came to fight the dude with the other half of his medallion, the guy that has his parents' souls locked in the medallion. And they find out basically if the medallions ever were to be joined, yes, that person would have a bunch of power, but it would cause like a power feedback that would destroy like Los Angeles, Ooh. like that big of an explosion. It's mm-hmm. so like, well, we can't let that happen. Um. But they're going to go to, like, this, like, basically, they get away from him, and a little bit of time passes, so they're going to go to the street festival. And um, so his cute little cousin, Chick, she, she's dancing. She's going to be dancing at the festival. Aww. 
and then like his uh, other cousin, the adorable gay cousin, who's amazing. <laughs> um, he he like designed all the stuff, and like they're, they're going there and they're having fun, right? Uh, the very first thing they do is get tacos, and that made me hungry. Uh, and I just caught I want tacos. So, anyways, <laughs> um, and then of course the bad guy attacks, and then once again with some Spider Man Two energy a lot of the NPCs are just like, don't mess with one of us. Like, oh. it's just great. Like, like the taco guy steps up, uh, some dude in the door mask, like all that oh. stuff. It's great. Um, you also discover his cousin, he gave his cousin or the, the, the girl cousin who has magic. She gave her brother a little stone and basically said, uh, when you need to hold it over your head like this. And he does. And it makes him a, as Tekken energy sword. <gasps> oh my god, that's so cool. <laughs> right? yes. like, so love that shit. And so they just start fighting and then like Yeah, they basically fight off all the bad guys. There's some uh, dinosaurs and then Reptil is able to like keep his cuz remember if he goes full dinosaur, he loses control of himself. Right. He's able to actually embrace himself and oh. understand basically come to grips with everything so he's able to go full dinosaur without losing control oh that's so cool and yeah, yeah. not not a classic not a cliche t-rex but a fucking dope ass pterodactyl <laughs> yeah he transforms a couple times different dinosaurs in this nice one, so. okay um but basically they get a hold of the other guy's medallion and destroy it and throw him back into his home world basically um and then they keep having the festival and i still want some tacos i'm very <laughs> hungry um so <laughs> But it's it's really cool. It's a lot of fun, and it basically, I think, because we had a delay between three and four of like longer than it should have. Yeah, and I think it's because in this they actually reference that Kamala's laws repealed. Oh, okay, cool. So they had to wait for that to happen. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, uh, it's pretty cool, and he's basically like, I'm gonna be a hero because he basically retired at the beginning of this book. He wasn't a hero anymore. Yeah, and he's like, I'm gonna be a hero. I'm not hiding anymore. Here I am. I'm ready. So. Also, he, um, they hint that him and Anya Corazon are now maybe a couple. Oh, maybe they're going nice. to be a couple, which I'm like, that's cool. I mean, you don't have to put the two Hispanic characters together, but that's cool, I guess. So, <laughs> like, but no, I, I, I'd be totally fine with that because I love her anyways. And then they do hint you want more of him. Okay. Look out for the next Marvel voices. So, uh, for community lives. Okay, cool. Then I, I was going to ask, like, did it end kind of like a um, werewolf by night, or it's kind of like maybe we'll see him, or was there going to be a. A preview Literally, part. he's like, I'm going to be a hero now. Okay. Just so I expect him to show Expecting. Someone. Okay. I'm sure we're going to have something like Champions coming. Yeah. And I'd anticipate him being in that. So, But yeah. Uh, so that is all of the uh, Marvel books that I have solo. Now, everything else, Josue has read. Mm-hmm. But Josue was not able to get his Marvel books. He read digitally. Yes. So he might not be able to like show me specific panels and stuff, but... Uh, we're definitely going to talk about everything. So, yeah. also, you haven't seen my covers yet, which I'm excited about. United States of Captain America, number four. I got the character design cover because I love these. Oh, my God. Yeah. She was so great. Yeah. So, uh, written by Christopher Cantwell, penciled by Ron Lim, inked by Cam Smith and Scott Hanna. The backup story is written by Alyssa Wong. Woo! And art by Jody Nishijima. Uh, coloring by Matt Mia and letter by Joe Haramagna. So, in the last issue, Bucky finally showed up. So, we got Sam, Bucky, and Steve. And then Aaron shows back up. Aaron's great. I love it. Yeah. Uh, which is weird. I was like, they called Aaron in. Wow, okay. Um, and then another new Captain America shows up, Ariel, the campus Captain America. <laughs> we'll talk about her origin in a moment. Um, and they're basically like, all right, there's one more guy we got to get. And literally, Bucky's like, absolutely not. Oh, fuck like, no. I, I don't want to. <laughs> And we find out the the person actually in charge of all this was Warrior Woman the entire time, which is a cool throwback to the literally 40s comics. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, they're basically breaking into NORAD. Um, so Steve and Bucky go down to the local bar, and there he is, our final Captain America, U.S. agent, God damn crashed it. off his head. Oh my God. Just talking shit. Like he just, I love him so much. He's the absolute worst. And he's just like, I love that their whole thing is like, you know, we don't like each other and we're nothing alike, but at least we believe in the same things. You know, like, yeah. that's literally the only thing they have in common. I love the bit where they're on the motorcycles and he has to ride behind Bucky and he's like, <laughs> I, could, I could drive my bike. And he's like, you're drunk. <laughs> like, like, like the, Captain America's like, I'm Captain America. I'm not going to let you drive a motorcycle. Or even the kids in the back is like, we could have fucking taken instead of like using this 400,000 mile piece of trash. <laughs> Shitbox. <laughs> yeah. 
And then they reveal that basically they're trying to free Hate Monger. And anyone who's a Captain America fan knows that Hate Monger is basically the living hate from Adolf Hitler. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, they show up, they fight with Sin, Speed Demon, and Warrior Woman, or excuse me, Commander Krieger. <laughs> they make a point of that. And um, yeah, they, they just have a really good fight. And they find out that um, Speed Demon's actually hypnotized. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't actually think, he didn't, wasn't aware of his actions. So he's like, this is messed up, basically. Um, they take Sin into captivity, and obviously he gets away. And uh, basically they have to find a warrior woman now. And the best part is uh, they're like, well, uh, Speed Demon's like, I don't remember anything. And Sin's like, uh, I, on the other hand, my father invented the most hideous torture techniques that exist. I've mastered every one of them. What on earth do you Cub Scouts plan on doing to make me talk besides asking politely? And then U.S. agents like, fellas, I got this. <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> Hi, Cynthia. John Walker. I was expelled from the Cub Scouts. Why don't we have a chat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagine them having a short conversation or be like, get me the fuck away from this guy. Yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> could you imagine? <laughs> and then the backup story was just really cool. Really I'm good. just loving these backup stories. It's a way of telling, like unique stories in the Marvel universe you mm-hmm. know, with, with new characters. She might be my favorite one yet of the new ones. I really like her. A she lot. definitely rose. Like, I think like, I'll be honest at first. I thought she was the girl from the second issue. And I'm like, yeah. Uh Oh, she they, appeared early. Yeah. I thought it was her, but I was like, no, that wasn't her name. And I had to go back and look. Right. And I was and like, they changed her look too completely. I thought it was weird. I know. I was like, I was like, Oh, they, they hella light skinned her and they straightened out her hair. It's like, yeah. fuck, no, don't do that. And then it's like, Oh no. Okay. Cause we got a different person here. And I, yeah, Joe Gomez and, and her Ariel are just like top my, right now for my caps. Yeah. And it, she literally like, again, the campus captain America, where she basically helps take down a rich douchebag who does whatever he wants to girls. Yeah. And that, that was really cool, and it involved also a bunch of girls dressing as Captain America. So that was awesome. It was a great, it was a great plan, and then to just like bring the party back to the to the other girl, I was like, oh, so good. And then for her to be like, oh, I, I think I kind of want one of the shield. I want a shield too. It's like, yes, girl, fucking queen, get it. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Only one issue left. Yeah, Is everybody gonna you know. come back? Maybe. Oh, that'd be so cool. Yeah, that'd be good. I wonder if another. Is there another Captain America that's alive that ha- hasn't? Shown up. I'm trying to think. Oh, all, all the ones from the 70s and 60s are dead. Yeah. Um, I was like, yeah, I think that's it. For maybe like, Sharon like, Carter. She wasn't Captain America, but she had. She was like, she had powers for a while there in Captain America. I think she I, was a super soldier. I don't remember if and when he did die, but uh, the other Nomad, Captain America's son from the future, that came back to the to the past. I don't know if he died. Oh, yeah. 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 Hmm. Oh, Patriot would be cool. Oh, Patriot Patri- would be so Patriot. good. Yes. I miss Patriot. So, I mean, this is already written. They can't change <laughs> it, but, but we love you guys. It's good. To yeah. Me. But so far, these, these, these caps have been awesome. Like the gate white one, a black cap, uh, an indigenous, cap, and now a Filipina cap. Like, yes. Give me all these diverse caps. Yeah. Awesome. So oh, yeah. the cover for the next one looks really dope too. Yeah. So next up, is an ending in two different ways. Guardians of the Galaxy number 18. Uh. And I already showed Jose the cover I got where it's the Guardians with the Dormammu marks on their face. Yeah. Which is great. Written by Al Ewing, drawn by Juan Fergueri, colored by Federico Blee, and lettered by Corey Petit. So I'll just start at the end. This is apparently the end of the book. Mm-hmm. Now, Marvel has not announced this as a cancellation. Uh, there's just no other issues announced so far. Yeah. They might just come back to it. Yeah. Um, but it won't be till at least next year, according to solicits, basically. Hmm. So, okay. It's also the end of The Last Annihilation. Yes. And it was done in such a cool way. Yeah, it was. <laughs> uh, Doom just being awesome. Just ridiculous. Okay, Doom was like, fucking awesome. <laughs> like, just... <sighs> I like that Rocket, like how everybody had to team up to basically make the ultimate weapon. Like, so they made this gigantic gun, right? <laughs> and Rocket is just like delivered by Manifold. So that's cool. Yeah. Loaded with anti magic bullet made of pure Mysterium, courtesy of Krakoa. <laughs> um, 
basically now that Peter's on board, it's also an element gun because all of his guns are element <laughs> guns. Um, and then he said, uh, they're going to let, uh, they're going to let, um, Gamora take the shot. Cause she's the deadliest woman in the galaxy. And then I like the bit. It's just like, he's already in the barrel. It's Nova <laughs> behind the bullet ready with full Nova force. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's such a ridiculous, like fucking like, like just the mechanics of this are absolutely ridiculous, but I absolutely like love the it. term sure fire is textbook written here. <laughs> Yeah. Now, one thing I'm going to say, okay, this might mean something. It might not. Okay. Mm. Before I read this issue, I saw a lot of people being like talking about the conversation Gamora and Peter have. Oh, mm -hmm. where he says, I love him too, you know, talking about Nova. And she goes, I know that makes it better. I saw a lot of people being like, oh, how are they going to get their way out of this one? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's pretty incriminating. But then the very next thing I was like, it still says, because we all do care that much for each other because we're not a team. We're a family. All of us are family. And I'm like, that's not, that, that's not gay baiting. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> not like, that's just that literally straight up said family. Like immediately afterwards, I'm like, Al Ewing has given us the most like, like sexual orientation, diverse book in comics. So don't, I, we don't have to look for it if it's not there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's that one I was just kind of like, no. Especially because, like, there's so many scenes in the end, too, where it's like, well, that couple's gay, that couple's gay. And then again, like, you do have, like, that trio shot again of, like, of, like, Nova. Yeah. Uh, other and it, it might be, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at that in that specific line. I saw some people being like, oh, this is confirmation. How are they going to get out of this one? Yeah. I don't read it like that. I didn't read it. I wanted yeah. to, but then you're right. Like then the family Western out there, and then but then at the end to where it's like the, the yeah. three of them. It reminded me of the scene at the end of Hawks Box with uh, uh, Cyclops, Gene, and Wolverine. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> so, so they basically shoot gigantic door. This is the most ridiculous shit in the comics. <laughs> I love this gigantic door mammu with a planet for a head. They shoot him with a giant space bullet. <laughs> Just so great. We do. We are found. We do find out that Doctor Doom has retained most of Dormammu's magic. Yeah, which is terrifying. And then we also get a party, and it's all the Guardians hanging out. It's literally all of them. Mm-hmm. And there's Wiccan and Hulk Lane just making out. Yep. You know, like just flat out making out in front of everybody, which is great. No shame. Love it. We get to see um, Hercules and um, what do they call him? He's not Protector anymore. Maybe it's just Captain Marvel now. I don't know. Um, but we can see them canoodling a little bit. We can <laughs> see Phyla and Moondragon. And just so much fun. And yeah, it's just like, you know, let's have an enjoy. I like that it's like, let's have a break while we can enjoy it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was like, okay, that's not confirmation. It's over or anything like that. So it had, it had like, and I obviously Guardians is not going to die, die anytime soon with like the MCU, but it has just such a similar ending to um, Dan Abnett's. 2008 run where they they kind of all ended like in a in one giant toast to each other because like yeah we we succeed on the mission and then of course then we got like the bendis run a few, few years later after that but it had this one had like a very similar vibe to dan abnitz i love the huge group shot at the end especially where uh quasar uses his band so you can see the other quasar yeah and she sw- swaps in with him all the time so we got to get her in the group shot somehow <laughs> which i thought was great and also my boy Umbaku up in the corner. Oh, I know. <laughs> so, but dude, I just, I loved this run. It was 18 issues, and if this is it for that run, I mean that sucks. But I loved it. Everybody should probably pick it up. It's just so much fun. Read it on Marvel Unlimited. Yeah, it's just really really good. So I did love the moment with uh, Doom when he's reading everybody's tarot cards and like what they. Oh be. yeah, it was such a good moment. <laughs> How he made them out, like he basically pointed out they're like like galactic elemental forces like, well, I, I'm like, yeah they kind of are actually well, i like it yeah i like it from the beginning too like like drax's card like on his card it looked it was like an homage to like his old classic suit yeah I, I like that touch yeah all right let's move on to the death of dr strange number one okay i got the peach momoko variant <gasps> let me see oh that is so good look at his face yeah, that's so good. See, that's, that's, how, that's how my mustache should come down, too. Like that it's nigh Draculean. <laughs> <laughs> so, written by Jed McKay, drawn by Lee Garvet, colored by Antonio Favela, letter by Corey Petit. I loved how this is written. This is one of my favorite styles of telling a story like this. Yeah. And it makes me so happy where it's a day in the life. 
but it's you don't know it's the last day in the life. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I love that storytelling trope. Um, so literally, Stephen Strange wakes up, and his dog, Bones, is like, hey, let's bats. go on a walkie. Oh, Bats. Sorry, Bats. I don't know why I said Bones. Bats is like, hey, let's go for a walkie. He's like, you're, you're dead. You don't need to walk. He's like, walkie. <laughs> Basically. Like, no, what, even gets how, how he guilts them, too. He's like, yeah, no, you're dead. You don't need walkie. He's like, yeah, my biological need for walkies disappeared around the time my heart gave out and died from not, not enough, enough walkies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he keeps telling them basically, you're going to die this entire issue, which is weird. <laughs> so Strange gets up, he gets he cleans up, sees Wong. Wong's like, Would you like some breakfast before walking? <laughs> <laughs> so great. They walk around. And yeah, it's just like a fun day in the life. He's a surgeon, and here's him solving magical problems. And it's really just like this is what he does all day. He goes to Strange Academy. Yes. It's going to play very heavily into the crossover coming up. <laughs> and he has a little moment with Dormam or Doyle Dam- Dormammu, which was really sweet. Yeah. And then there's a, you know, a bunch of demons attacking the baseball diamond. And uh, him and Magic team up to fight him, which is great because Magic is always great. Um, well, she's embarrassed she's- because they came from her realm, too. <laughs> Yeah, she's like, my bad, basically. Also, they they make the point throughout this that Doctor Strange, as the Sorcerer Supreme, keeps this barrier around the planet, basically preventing demons from constantly invading, is basically <laughs> what it is. But yeah, he just does all these cool missions, and, you know, it's the end of the day, he goes home, he's, you know, he has his feet in a mystical cauldron to rest <laughs> them, it's all bubbling weird and stuff. With tentacles? <laughs> yeah. And he op- does a knock at the door. He's like, well, Wong's gone. So is, so is the dog. Let's, oh, what's going on here? He opens up the door and he goes, enter. And he goes, hmm, we don't see who it is. What are you doing at my doorstep? It's been a long day. Your last day. And there's a big explosion of magic. Yeah. And he's tied to the wall. And he's like, basically like, this isn't over if you kill me, basically. And he gets stabbed. Everybody shows up. And he's already dead. And Baron Murdo shows up, which was great. And Ooh. he's just like, this oh, is my kill, motherfuckers. Like, well, who stole my kill, basically? Like, kill stealing son of a bitch. <laughs> like, uh, he's like, basically, they're like, you probably did it. He's like, trust me, basically, if, if I killed him, you'd know. I would make a point of it. Um, and then all of a sudden, all these demons start invading the planet because the seal's gone. Yeah. And then a portal opens up. Whew. And an old version of Doctor Strange like like from the 70s yeah that was the 70s era yeah pops out of the portal and is just like oh if I've been released then the worst must have happened we must move quickly tell me what year is it Ooh. <laughs> this was such a good great fucking issue because the whole time mm-hmm. when, when, when Steven was alive um you would just get these really pretty, these really nice close-up shots of his face. Like, it, like the book wanted you to remember his face in the present time, so that when yep. this happens, you do get to see like this old retro style of Doctor Strange. Not just because he has like a different color scheme now and the different gloves, but the face is just distinguishedly different. Yeah. So I'm looking at the checklist, and I'm buying every one of these books. By the way, there's some I might skip, but gonna, I will yeah. be getting most of them. The Death of Doctor Strange 1 through 5, first of all. Yeah. We're getting Death of Doctor Strange Avengers. Strange Academy Presents. Yeah. Doctor Strange. Which, by the way, they told us in the story has closed down because of it. Oh, shit. Okay. Did you, did you see that? No. Is a letter to uh, the Enchantress telling her to come pick up her kids, basically. It's right here. Oh, I didn't get that last page on here. Uh, oh. No, it's not the last page. It's the, the digital code one. Oh, I don't get ads. Dear, dear Miss Enchantress, we regret to inform you that following the death of our headmaster, Dr. Stephen Strange, we'll be closing the school indefinitely. We hope to reopen as soon as the matters surrounding this tragic event are resolved. In the meantime, we request that you come pick up your sons, Irik and Alvi, as soon as possible. Basically, but she's in jail. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to be interesting. Yeah, no, I don't, hey, get, any- I don't get ads. I, I didn't see that. Oh, that's cool. Um, Death of Doctor Strange Spider-Man, Death of Doctor Strange White Fox, Death of Doctor Strange Blade, Death of Doctor Strange X-Men Black Knight. Yeah. Hell yeah. Right? <laughs> Black Knight always seems to cross over the X-Men. I love it. So, um, Well, whichever ones you don't get, I'm going to have on, on my Marvel account, Honestly, I'm, so just, I'm just in the fence for, for White Fox. I'm just yeah, not familiar I'm with on. the character. Oh, I can't wait. White Fox is great. Okay, cool. So. Yeah. So, yeah, that's Death of Doctor Strange number one. Really great. So... Let's move on. Um, 
Let's go to Moon Knight, number three. Ooh. So, uh, I told you about my adventure trying to get Moon Knight. Uh-huh. I knew I needed to get it, because I knew you weren't getting your Marvel books, and this is the one book we could not skip. Yeah. So, so I got Moon Knight. I got the cover A, of course. But mm-hmm. when I was there, the guy was like, hey, we got one of the variants. I'm like, really? I'm like, it's so- everything's sold out everywhere. How do you have one of the variants? He's like, yeah, it's the Miles Morales variant. I'm like, nice. yeah, I'm going to take it. So... <laughs> Uh, I don't know if oh, that one has, is cool. It's like a Moon Knight style yeah. outfit, but in the red and black. Well, that, so that's we, he's supposed to get a new suit. He's supposed to be having a new suit, right. and that kind of looks like it, or maybe it could well, be. Well, in every one of these covers, he has a different suit on. Oh, it's a different. Oh, it's probably an homage to the. It, it, I think it's like an homage to whoever's book he's on. It yeah, it's like their outfit. So. Okay, because he is supposed to get like a, a hoodie as well with it. Yeah, so I'm not going to open that ever. That's going <laughs> to go in the box. So when Miles Morales is the biggest hero in <laughs> comics. Uh, so, anyways, Moon Knight number three. God, I love this book so much. So good. It's just so fucking good, and it's done in such a just enchanting way. Enchanting is the word I love. Um, so, second book in a row written by Jed McKay, uh, art by Alessandro Capuccio, color by Rochelle Rosenberg, and letter by Corey Petit. And again, I, I do absolutely love, like you said, his two different outfits. Yes. You know. It's there's him like business him, <laughs> there's party him basically, and I also love how the art is different. Yes, like like how the line he, stretch. Like, yes, and it's it's sketchier. Looking. Yeah, like this is so exact and straight. Mm-hmm. But then when it's when he's in his hood, everything is like it's almost like they're a little bit blurry. Yeah. Oh no, I, I totally see. I, I I get the effect you're trying to say, but again, like it's so hard to put into words unless like we're all reading it too. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a little more wild. It's a little more yeah. exaggerated. Like, yeah. But basically, he gets in a fight with the other Fist of Conchu. I didn't expect this to happen so soon. I was expecting this maybe like end of the first volume, maybe right? in issue six. Um, but they get into a fight, and basically, the other Fist of Conchu goes after his friends, you know, his, assi- his, his assistant, all of, his, all of his buddies, soldier. And he's just like, I'm going <laughs> to... So basically, like, I'm gonna kick his ass, and then Moon Knight shows up behind him with a fucking baseball bat. <laughs> so just a little cheap shot, it literally just not stops. Yeah, he's. Li- I like. It. He's like, oh yeah, yeah. You have all these, you know, fancy fighting because you have dead men's memories. He's like, but you never earned it. Not like I did for a lifetime of busted knuckles, broken bones, and bloody horror. It's like at the end of the day, you're just a doctor dancing in borrowed shoes. <laughs> oh, well, the fact that it, he says that, like the broken knuckles uh, and bloody horror. Thud hit. No. Yeah. Thud hit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so good. And he basically is like, get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, buddy. This is like the, the second time where I was just like, I had to like pause and step up and I was like, Sochi, I just need to fucking dump this on you really quick. I lit it because like I, I, I prefaced it. Like, well, I'll just talk about the same time here where like this issue was really dope with the ending. Yeah. The, the fight was awesome. But it really, it was everything that, that Moon Knight said at the end or that you're just like, what? That was awesome. Because again, like la- the last issue was awesome. The whole moon sequence. Oh, it, yeah. All of the, the, that mysticism wasn't really in this issue. But man, was the dialogue so on point. Like, what was it? So go, Fist of Conchu, drag yourself from my temple. Like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other line that it's more of a callback to when he was in, in this therapy session and avoid my attention in the future, lest I become even more interesting. When he was like, "I have many, I have, I have an enemy," and the therapist is like, "I would, I would assume you have many enemies." And he's like, "No, basically, based on the way I work, I don't really have that many yeah, enemies. <laughs> don't really keep them around." Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. like oh, such a strong yeah. issue. Fuck yeah, yeah. All right, now we're gonna take a trip over to Krakoa real quick for our X Men section. X Men Legends number seven. Written okay, so X Men Legends, of course, is honoring the the past times of comics. Right? Yeah. Um, so so far, we've gotten some of my favorite runs ever repeated, including the Peter David X Factor. We got the <laughs> Simonsons X Factor. It was Chris Claremont X Men right? Yeah. With uh the 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 third Summers brother. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Well, now we're going back to one I didn't think about, but man, I'm so happy. Nice. Larry Hama Wolverine. This is the the it's not the golden age because golden age like kind of indicates the first good age. Sorry, sorry. The, the first one was uh, Fabian N- N- Nicesa. Nicesa, yeah. Sorry, I don't know why I thought Chris Claremont. Maybe because it should be. But anyways, <laughs> um, so <laughs> get him back, you cowards. Uh, so, <laughs> um, 
So yeah, Larry Hama riding Wolverine, which was a really cool era of Wolverine. This is when he was basically teamed up with Jubilee all the time. Nice. Uh, so Larry Hama riding, Billy Tan drawing, Chris Sotomayor coloring, and Joe Carmagna lettering. This is also the time where they really kind of like explored Madripoor and mm-hmm. the Far East and, and Wolverine's ties to it. So that kind of ties into what we got here. And this is this was just a really fun action movie like Wolverine thing with just little bits of humor, but not too much, you know, like the bit where they're in the, the taxi and the guy's like, I didn't know there was a, you know, comic con at the aquarium. That's a weird place. <laughs> yeah. Just like, yeah. Uh, death strike shows up. They just have this awesome fight. Um, Jubilee is Jubilee. She's like the kid sidekick at this point. She played that part pretty well. I mm-hmm. always really liked that. Um, and basically Wolverine is trying to rescue some mutant kids that are being abducted and sold basically. And yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, I really enjoyed it. I really like the fact that the next issue obviously has Omega Red. So that's another great uh, callback to that era because Omega Red was like, like in that era, Omega Red was one of the most important um, uh, like Wolverine villains. And I just love the way that Billy Tan draws it. It's just going to be super, super cool. I'm just really excited about it. So X-Men Legends number seven. I'm just... Oh, I can't wait. I want to see more <laughs> X-Men eras. Like, you know. I do love how it's just bouncing all over the place, just like filling in these gaps. Like, yeah, like Wolverine in a suit, like like the way he's just drawn, like in that in that detail, like almost like the the way uh fuck what's his name? It'll come back to me. Fuck. But I love the I love the way the Wolverine suit is drawn. Also, like the whole scene in the beginning. There's so many, like, there's so much like missed out. I don't want to say missed out death, because like Obviously, he can't really go as hard right now with like with all the laws. But it seems like if Wolverine's going to kill somebody now, it almost has to be warranted, or hey, yeah, this, this has to be some some huge douchebag. I love that the, like in the beginning of this scene, this guy just like pokes him with a little knife and just mm-hmm. straight up just like murks him from behind him, just like almost like <laughs> raises a hand and put the three claws in his chest, and he almost makes a jo- he does make a joke about it. It's yeah, like, yeah. And like you don't see those moments like uh, you don't see those moments like much anymore, probably because of the laws and the whole, the whole thing of Krakoa. But I just appreciated this scene so much. Yeah, definitely. So that takes us to X Court number five. Oh. Uh, God, this is, this is such a good week of X Men. Uh, written by Teeny Howard, drawn by Alberto Foce, colored by Sunny Go, and lettered by Clayton Cowles. So, of course, uh, you know, there's been the attack on X Court headquarters by the Von Strucker twins and Sarah St. John. And it's, it's just, I just love this book so much. It's so weird. Because it's, you know, it's about a mutant company. Yeah. They still have the mutant beats. They still have the fights, you know, and stuff. But it's literally just like corporate warfare. But it's still all business. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the last issue, Madrox Prime was shot and killed. Oh. <laughs> and so the dupes are like, now what? <laughs> like, oh, it's so cool. Because they're doomed, basically. They yeah. have to be reabsorbed. And he's not there to reabsorb them. So they're trying to figure out what the fuck to do, right? And... We just get this really cool fight, and there's like an extended fight sequence with the Von Struckers where they got to keep the Von Struckers apart because their powers only work when they're together, holding together when they're touching each other. Yeah. Which when uh, do you remember that run of Thunderbolts when Andreas was in the Thunderbolts? Uh, during whose run? I I don't remember it. It was during the run with uh, Venom and Bullseye and stuff like that. Pre pre um pre uh, Dark X Men. Right. Okay, I, I know what Ryan you're yeah. talking about, but I wasn't really like a following. It was like, kind of when I was kind of starting to branch out to like other books. He was in the Thunderbolts, and his sister was dead. Oh, okay. And they did this creepy thing where he took some of her skin and wrapped it around the hilt of his sword, so he's still touching her Ooh. using his powers. It was creepy. Giggle. You know the that things people thing. say. Yeah, yeah. You know the things people say about Ultimate Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, like yeah. the incestual vibes it's not even subtle with the Von Struckers if you get into their stuff. It's ridiculous. Ew. <laughs> They're fucking weird. No, like, I, I started getting into that. I started getting into that run of Thunderbolts um, right around the the Secret Invasion run. Where I see a so whole like, era. So like a ghost and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was a good run. I really like that one. So, um, but yeah, basically they all have to work together and uh, we get a really cool moment with Celine. Where she tries to drain the dude, and he's yeah. basically like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm not real." <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we get this awesome moment with the Madrox dupes. So awesome, so it's so ridiculous cool. <laughs> and overpowered. Basically, there's there's going to be a big energy output explosion, 
and they come up with this thing where the the patented Mad- Madrox workflow, <laughs> where they basically circle around it, and as they absorb the impact from it, they create more dupes that absorb the impact from it, they create more <laughs> dupes, and basically just wipe out all the dupes, which was excellent. Just such such a ridiculous thing. But then we get a really cool, sweet ending where Madrox is brought back. And they're like, hey, we stopped it. And he's like, hey, listen. And like, basically, they talked about, like, how he didn't want the board seat to begin with. And they give him, they give Trinary his board seat. And he has a reunion with Layla. And he's like, hey, I just need to take a day or two with my family. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. such a good follow up, you know? So loved it. And then we get a tease with Henry Gyrick. Piece of shit. So. Yeah, good stuff. I'm loving this. It was so. It was so. I mean, it was a good issue. Like the uh, the action was like on point throughout it, and then yeah, that mad rock sequence where like, no fucking way. They're gonna do what? And then you get the info page like, this can work. This can totally work. <laughs> and radically, let's say trust the science and like, trust the science. Trust the science. I also love it because little note at the bottom. I'm not making another dupe just to make break, the break room dishes. It takes 10 seconds to wash out your oatmeal <laughs> bowl. We're super geniuses, guys. Let's get it together. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Two books left. X-Men 3. Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, I'm saving it for last. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so X-Men 3, written by uh, Gary Dugan, drawn by Pepe Larraz, colored by Marte Gracia, letter by Clayton Cowles. I love this X-Men team. Oh, me Each too. issue, I just love it more and more and more. And they really have great chemistry. It's a good mix of the old and the new. Mm-hmm. It's just great, you know? Like, La Raz just makes them look so fucking good, too. Yeah, especially the one that always jumps out at me is Shiro. Yeah. Shiro's mask. He, he, it's like the old school Age of Apocalypse mask, almost. Mm-hmm. Like, I love that look. So basically, as we know, each each issue, they're just throwing another threat. Things keep threatening them. In this case, the High Evolutionary. And he's just like, hey, you colonized Mars. Good job, guys. And he's like, here's a bomb that will make all humans on Earth <laughs> impotent. And you can inherit the Earth. And they're like, I love that. <laughs> basically, like, I was imagining, like, the way Rogue. Rogue was immediately like, fuck this guy. Yeah. Because she, w- she knew him from the Uncanny Avengers run with Reminder. When, they, when the counter-evolutionary story. Like, uh-huh. And so she's like, like he shows up and everybody's like, what's going on? She's like, fuck this guy, like immediately. <laughs> and I was just imagining her heckling him in my head the entire time he's giving his speech. Just like, so is your mom. And like and so I was laughing so hard. So then when she actually yelled out, like, you can stop right there, wherever it is. We don't want it to start <laughs> laughing so hard. I was like, yeah, she's like, just get the fuck out of here. And then I absolutely caught oh, so many moments in this, like where he's like, you know, maybe we can help. Like I helped you, Rogue, when I and then this shot. Yup. Of him just getting great dead. punch. So good. She's like, get the fuck out, basically. And then <laughs> the next person to jump in, Polaris. <laughs> yeah. So they have a big fight, and uh just dude, there's so many gorgeous moments in this book. Yeah. This moment of Everett carrying Sunfire was absolutely yes. cool. I love that shot. Um and this is for all the Cyclops haters out there. Cyclops is amazing. <laughs> He's an amazing character. He had two really great moments in this in the funny ways. Like the part at the end where... Uh, oh, and also Laura defending Everett was fucking awesome. Yes. He's, I'm excited. Anyways, Everett gives up a light drop of his blood to save the day. And the moment I was talking about is when... Let me see. Oh, that's right. What he says. <laughs> yeah. Where, is this your yeah. first time, basically? <laughs> no, no, no. The other one. The um, I'm trying to find it. It's the, one of the one of the bad guys. I'm trying to remember which one has Cyclops in a headlock, and he's he's like, basically they call a truce, and um, oh here it is the monkey. It's right here. Uh, okay. The monkey has him in a headlock, and he's completely overpowered, and he's like. This is your lucky day, <laughs> gentlemen. I had you right where I wanted you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Scott is amazing. So uh, we also re- get a really cool moment of Everett copying everybody's powers at once. Yes. Which is a hint of his true abilities, you know. And then uh, the cool thing is High Evolutionary tells them about Cordyceps Jones. Yes. Which is cool because I think it's about time for they f- them to find out. Mm-hmm. I don't think they should just keep fighting shit he throws at them for six issues. <laughs> yeah, no. It'd be too long of a dark. Yeah, so... And then uh, we get a goofy moment at the end with with uh, them like celebrating with the kids of the local village. Um, 
And then basically they're like, well, have, have, some of us have to go in space. Some of us have to stay behind. Looks like Jean's going to... Jean won the toss, so I don't know if that means she goes in space or stays behind. <laughs> Are you so sure you're not peeking when we do this? What? How dare you even ask? <laughs> and then we get another tease towards Ben Urich. Ugh. Which I'm very scared about. And then we get another tease towards the guy that was going to terraform Mars. They're they're ticking along with these little background stories. They're going to pay off soon. I'm mm-hmm. very excited about it. This series has been so good. It's yeah, quality, straight quality. I know we, we were kind of bummed out. And like, I was like, oh damn it, they're renumbering it. Like, why would they do that? Just like, I would have been fine with keeping them going into like this being like issue twenty four. Uh, but no, like, I have no problems with this run right now. Yeah, which leads us to our last book. And of course, I saved this one for last. Oh boy, because I didn't know this was going to be a one shot. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> like, so I had low expectations. I didn't expect everything to get resolved right away. But but we did have five X-Men. issues to lead up to it too. <laughs> yeah, X Men: The Onslaught Revelation. Yeah, written by Sizeberger, drawn by Bob Quinn, colored by Hava Tartaglia, letter by Clayton Cowles. Ah, uh, the way of X has finally paid off. Yeah. So, with everything with happening with on onslaught, we find out. You know, we we get confirmation of what we've been, what he basically Nightcrawler's thought mm-hmm. that onslaught is taking the missed time and consuming it, and basically getting more and more powerful. And he find basically everybody has onslaught in them. We find out that Legion has already purged Nightcrawler of onslaught, which is good. Because that's how Way of X ended was Nightcrawler getting resurrected, so we knew he had onslaught in him. Mm-hmm. Um, but Legion already purified him, and then he basically kidnaps Pixie, and they <laughs> purify Pixie, and using Pixie's soul dagger because she has a soul dagger like Ileana's soul knife, oh soul sword, she starts, you know, curing other people, including my girl Loa. Yes, more Loa, please. Um, who is apparently trying to make it work with Mercury? Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Um, I don't know. Part of me still ships Mercury with Wither back in the day. Oh, that's back in the day. We're, we're, we're in the I now. Know, I know. Part <laughs> of me still ships that. But anyways, yeah. It's fine. Everybody should be happy. Um, but to my shocking surprise, the heart of this book is Fabian fucking Cortez. I was... I, I've been literally counting the fucking seconds to just hear your thoughts on this issue just because of this th- that what you just said i would okay i hate fabian cortez yeah we, i've made that clear on this show and i think that it would have been very easy for them to tell me this story in a way that i wouldn't give a shit about him at all mm-hmm. about like, boohoo nazi shut the fuck up basically yeah. but they managed to tell it in a way that i'm like oh and then I was like, what? What was that? What was that sound? What is <laughs> Wait, you're like, maybe Kakroa is for second chances. Wait, no. <laughs> and the way he's like, I it, I think it's because of the way they orchestrated his breakdown. What he said. Yes. Is what made me be like, okay. Yep. This this might be something. Like, like this this part right here is what we're... Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that, that was literally when, when I started getting like... Wait, what the fuck am I feeling right now for this character? I need to reevaluate everything. Yeah. His face changing. He says, "I've hated myself for as long as I can remember." Yes, and I like the fact that they still very much acknowledge he was a rich, privileged white asshole. Mm-hmm. And if they had tried to hide that, I would have hated it. Yeah, but they addressed it, and he's literally like, he even addresses, "Was I a persecution tourist? Poor little rich boy, thirsty for the struggle? Maybe." And I was like, "Yeah, he's self aware. Holy shit!" Goddamn. <laughs> And the whole thing, like, his power is just to power up other people. And that's, you know. So it's still not, the, the glory is still not on him. Yeah, it's still, it, and with an egotist like him, that bothers him, you know. Yeah. What I mean? like, and I was like, okay, I get this. And he just comes to grip with it all. And, like, when he wipes away the tear with the back of his hand, I'm yeah. like, fuck. And then him and Lost are talking. And she's like, I cannot forgive you. But today I do not hate you. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and then, oh, and also, um, side thing that's happening. Onslaught has basically infected everybody. Yeah. He's infected uh, Professor Xavier and is quickly deleting all the backups, which scared the shit out of me. Me too, him, dude. Way. Like, I literally had to I was like, wait, did I actually read that right? Oh, no. <laughs> and then he gets all the mutants together to have 
And I was wondering what Soy thought about this. Basically, a giant rave where they end up killing each other at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, um, and basically, they're trying to prevent this while also solving the issue, which we'll get back to in a second. Mm-hmm. Um, they keep kidnapping people, which is great. Uh, Dr. Nemesis shows up with all of his funguses on his head and is like, <laughs> I'm just going to read it. Yes, feast. Lick the face of my mycological rapture. <laughs> Prepare for the great reaping with psychotropic joy and pain. Eat your fungal gods. Eat your fungal gods. <laughs> backflip, backflip through neural chaos and ride the sweet tempest of science. <laughs> Him and Dazzler, I'm shipping harder and harder. I, th- at this point, I'm hella fucking shipping them too. <laughs> so, also DJ. DJ is clearing. Like all these little bitty characters that we know from the other run. It's just so much fun to see them get moments. Um, and basically, you find out he gave them a certain mushroom to make them kind of mellow out so yeah. they don't murder each other for a bit. And all this is resolved and the Fabian Cortez stuff and everything is resolved in side of Legion's mind. Yes. Legion has turned his mind into basically a temple. Yep. And where everybody is one. And long story short, they basically trick everybody from the party to go into Legion's mind. And they need to cure it. And what, what the, the thing that happened back going back to Lost is she was the initial infection of Onslaught. Hmm. Uh, when she was brought into Krakoa, uh, I think it was Orcus, had put a little bit of Onslaught in her and hid it inside of her hatred for Fabian Cortez because it's the one thing she would never let go. Mm-hmm. And so by them exercising that, they were able to bring it forward and bring him out. Which brings out Onslaught, who looks sick. I know, it is a cool design. <laughs> yeah. And he's like fighting them and stuff. And then we get the moment that Josue pointed out on oh, Facebook or on Twitter oh. that made me so happy because I got to post one of my favorite songs. Um, <laughs> yeah. Also, because she's amazing. Basically, talking to Dust, Legion telling her, you can connect a billion particles with that effort. Turning his hand is literally the least amazing <laughs> thing about you. Whoever called you dust did you a disservice. You know what would have been better? Congregation. So dope. <laughs> Such a great magical moment. This character that we just love to bits mm-hmm. and to a name that I fucking hated dust. I I, I hated that name. It just it might, was really lazy. Might as well just call her dirt, call her filth. And it's just <laughs> yeah. like, it's not wind. a good name. Dirty wind. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's congregation. And then you just think about, about her. You think about Soraya as a whole and it's like, perfect fucking name great yeah. name and so basically in the altar they're able all to, she's able to connect all these mutants minds and they're able to purge onslaught down into a little gym that nightcrawler grabs and says we rule us yes. crushes it <laughs> oh. you know he got that line from from legion from when he's like i rule me when he has like the two zorns <laughs> yeah i'm just I, I, dude this gave me so many chills this whole book yeah oh I, I, obviously dude yeah and then basically, like, they're going to turn David's head into a new HQ for something. Mm-hmm. And they're like, mutant cops with my brain's precinct. Council won't like it. He's like, I'm, it's not the police. We must defend what unites us, not punish the growing pains, which is so fucking great, by the way, that line. He's like, what then? Peacekeepers, shepherds, mutant Jedi? He's like, nine. I was thinking legionaries. Yes. <laughs> Did you get the coming soon at the end? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, fucking okay, yeah, dude. We keep the peace, we keep the law, we keep the spark. And then the cast? Keith? Dr. Nemesis, Pixie, Nightcrawler, uh, Juggernaut. Yes. Fuck yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's the ghost of Blindfold. Oh, okay. And I don't know who the dude in the forefront is. Yeah, I can't tell you there. Um, he's pretty generic, so but he's got a gun. Over uh over Juggernaut's shoulders. Is that congregation? Is that is that sand? Oh shit! You're right. Because it seems like we're getting half of the cover here, so it's like we could be some some stuff missing. Yeah, but dude, that's so cool. But yeah, if they bring back the ghost of uh, blindfold, mm-hmm. because her and Legion had that relationship, and that was addressed in Way of X, mm-hmm. so that'd be really cool. But she's also a precog. Oh shit! Oh fuck! So, yeah. But yeah, dude, this was fucking great. I absolutely loved it. It was such a great issue. And, it and one I, of my it's probably my favorite one shot of the year. Ooh, yeah. I mean, it, it was just it was so worth it. There were so many like great notes on this one. Not just like a borderline changing our minds over Fabian. 
Suraya getting a dope ass name. All of this kind of like wrapping up together was just like this whole common combination of Way of X, but then like mm-hmm. a combination from before Way of X to just like bring it, like get, getting it straight straightened out over like, all right, how much fun can the mutants really have here? And it's like, all right, we should probably chill and like do the shit right. And yeah, all this it, was just so worth it. Yeah. It completely paid off everything in Way of yes, X. Yes, thank you. There were so many things that were set up in Way of X that were paid off in this. Also, how much... Uh, little things like Mercury and Loa. Yes, that. The, the Dr. Nemesis Dazzler stuff. And then the big stuff, you know, you know, Legion with the Zorns and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, everything was paid off in the end. It was like a complete, really great, complete story. Nightcrawler no now. Hanging, yeah. no hanging problems. Everything's addressed. Lost was introduced us six issues ago. Yeah. Think about that. Like, that's crazy, you know? Like, ah. And the way it also faded quickly into everything that was going on mm-hmm. in the wider X universe. Yeah. Like, how it fit. It's very perfectly timed into the Hellfire Gala, as well as Erico, And it, it addressed all that. Yeah. You know, like, ah, oh, it was just really well-timed. Like, ah, oh, so good. Also, how much of a time skip did we have here with uh, Nightcrawler growing with that uh, facial hair? <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> yeah, it looks good on him. Oh, it looks uh, great on him. <laughs> yeah, so. But see, it, this is the thing I, I wanted to kind of close with was, I know a lot of people are upset that a lot of X books seem to be getting canceled. Mm-hmm. I think this is going to be how it works. Mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of these books are going to go forever. I think we're going to get extended minis and things are going to shift around because it's Krakoa. Things are going to change. And to me... The island is literally I love, shifting. I, I love X Factor and I wish X Factor was still going. Don't get me wrong. But there are hundreds and hundreds of known mutants, and we could do something with any of them. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, and if we just keep shifting around, we can shift the cast around. We can do different stories. And the problem is, we can't put out thirty X books a month. You know what I mean? That's not going to work. So, I like the idea of giving different people time to shine in the spotlight. Yeah, you know? I love Marauders. If it comes to an end, I'll be sad, but I know they're going to put something else in its place. Yeah, you know. So. I trust Marvel, like with, with the X books. So it's just those uh th- those times, like literally two years ago, where we felt like the Dawn of X was just gonna last forever, <laughs> and now we're just yeah. getting some ending, some chapters closing, and you're like yeah. my heart, my heart can't take whatever comes next. I want this to be the status quo forever. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we'll know after Inferno. Oh, I, yeah, oh for sure. But here's my thing: that that like spoiler alert. Mm-hmm. If they're getting a new book with Nightcrawler and this crew to, to like do the laws and to be the spark, mm-hmm. I, I don't think Inferno is going to destroy Krakoa. Why would they launch a book if? Krakoa's oh yeah, I know. Destroyed? So you know, like those kind of things kind of jump out at me, but but good because Krakoa is awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> it's really the best thing that's happened to X Men in thirty years, probably since Wolverine. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, um, yeah, that's everything. Uh, anything else you want to wrap up with, bro? Um, no, that was, that was pretty much it. Uh, thank you for uploading the codes. I uh, had a pleasure reading all yes. those marbles. Yes. Uh, so everybody out there, just to give you a quick heads up, there are two trade paperbacks you should be l- looking out for this week. Um, so the first one, of course, is the Autumnal from Vault. Yes. Pick it up. It's amazing. It blew my mind. I'm not a horror guy, and it's one of my favorite books. It's so good. Uh, and the other one is actually Scout's Honor. Mm-hmm. Uh, which uh, we actually, I, I've read. Yeah. Uh, I, I sent my uh, review copy over to Josue so he can give us a review once he reads it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm curious to see what you think because I love me some David Propose. And um, yeah, so pick those two up. They're both really good. They're both really worth your purchase uh, price. So um, that's pretty much it. I'm trying to think. Um, the only other thing is I'm almost done with the Shadow and Bone series. Mm-hmm. I've um, been powering through it because the... Her books actually read a lot easier than the, the crows. It's I think it's written for a younger age, okay. so it goes quicker. Um, and uh, I think it's pretty much all I've been reading because there's just a lot of comics. So, <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us on We Have Issues. Uh, so for our plugs, you can find us on our network Geek Elite Media at Geek Elite Media on Twitter as well as on Geek Elite Media. Dot com. You can find me on Twitter at WHI Podcast Keith. Our producer Liz at WHI Podcast Liz and Hostway at Hostway Reads Hostway. You can check out this show at WHI Podcast on Twitter. You'll be notified every time we um, post a new episode. You'll see a complete list of everything that we read that week. And you'll see me retweet a bunch of stuff that appeals to me from comic book creators and our fellow reviewers. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, you can also find our other show, Jukebox Vertigo, at Jukebox Vertigo on Twitter. This is the show that Hostway hosts, and it's bi-weekly. We always put together a new playlist based on a random theme every week. And this next one is actually great music videos. <laughs> and we will be getting a very super special debut yes. of a panelist. Hopefully, still crossing my fingers. <laughs> Haven't nailed her down yet. Okay. Uh, so... But she'll probably be there. Uh, but yeah, so uh, so at Jukebox Vertigo. And uh, our last episode that went up is Emo. And it, I was really actually really proud of this episode. Yeah. Because uh, you, me, and Steven had a really great conversation about the nature of Emo. Oh, yeah. And that alone was worth it. And then also we got a little bit of a hint or help from Stephanie Phillips Ooh. with an Emo pick after our interview. So <laughs> um, that is all my plugs. Hostway, anything before I wrap it up? Uh, you can also catch me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Hostway plays Hostway. I'm currently working on getting that platinum for God of War 3. Nice. Yeah, you just uh, you just platinum which one? God of War 3 Remastered. <laughs> You're the worst. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us, as always. We really, really, truly appreciate you, each and every single one of you. Once again, happy by visibility day, guys. Be yourselves, whoever you are out there. Unless you're a Nazi, then don't be a Nazi. Yeah, so. fuck off. Yeah, just fuck off. <laughs> so, thank you so much for joining us. And don't forget to always geek out. This concludes our broadcast.